Welcome to the second day of the conference Designing Pathways to Urban Carbon Neutrality, organized by Joseph Stefan Institute Energy Efficiency Center. My name is Tomasz Fatur, and I will be the moderator of the conference, which is organized in scope of Climate Path 2050 project, financed by LIFE program, managed by the European Commission and Slovene Ministry of Environment and Spatial Planning. LIFE Climate Path 2050 project supports the implementation of the Paris Agreement, both in providing various analysis on emission reduction potentials, models, projections, and impacts, and in providing decision support for planning of long-term energy and climate change strategies and implementation of measures by monitoring process. Let me thank all the participants for the participation, guest lecturers for your willingness to share your experiences with us, and my colleagues who helped prepare this conference. I will go briefly through the program of today's conference. We will have a session on challenges of carbon neutral pathways, modeling and analysis, with three lectures in the morning session, carbon neutral energy supply and the integration of sectors. Then there will be a short coffee break with the networking on, uh, and uh, will include also breakout rooms for networking of online guests. And then we'll have second set of lectures. After the lunch, there will be a roundtable discussion with the title, How Can New Challenges Be Addressed Through New Modeling Approaches and Analysis? For all participants uh, who joined us uh, conference online, due to situation, this conference is organized in a hybrid form. We are very enthusiastic with the number of participants, which come from over 25 countries from all over the world. For those guests who joined us online, there are technical information and instructions on the right hand of your screen in the chat section. You are welcome to actively participate at the conference by providing your feedback on your work on long-term energy and climate strategies and implementation process. Now I will start with the morning session. I would like to invite Professor Neven Duic from the University of Zagreb for his presentation. Uh, his presentation will be held online. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, invitation. And uh, uh, let me start uh, to talk about uh, uh, modeling of integration of sectors with a focus on uh, heat supply. So uh, uh, we are uh, uh, on the path of changing climates. Um, and uh, if we don't do anything, we will end up with uh, maybe three degrees higher temperature uh, or maybe uh, even five degrees higher temperature. What was agreed in Paris is to try to keep this uh, temperature increase uh, below, well below uh, two degrees uh, or what is mostly interpreted as 1.5 uh, degrees. Uh, in the meantime, the prices of uh, uh, different uh, uh, power technologies to produce electricity has changed tremendously. Uh, we have uh, uh, now uh, obvious situation that wind and solar are by far uh, the cheapest sources. Uh, this price of natural gas is a uh, US price. In uh, Europe, it is currently much more expensive, but in general, more expensive. Uh, nuclear is terribly expensive and coal is uh, going out of uh, the power system slowly. Uh, so it's obvious we are going to be building mostly uh, wind and solar. Uh, for last three years, uh, wind and solar are some like uh, 60 to 75 percent of all new capacities added uh, to the global power systems. Uh, how do we do uh, the worst case uh, situation? Because these uh, sources are obviously uh, variable. How do we build an energy system based on wind and solar? Uh, this is the actual curve of wind and solar in Europe uh, variations. Uh, and you can see that they never get really to zero. Wind is blowing at least a 10% uh, somewhere in Europe at any single particular time. 
So let's envisage that we build uh, several times more wind and solar than we actually need. Uh, the red curve is the legacy electricity demand. It means current electricity demand. So we built maybe three, five, uh, ten times more wind and solar uh, than we need because it's going to be cheap. What do, do we do with the rest of electricity? We need to build so much more in order to cover most of the needs. Uh, there are small white areas uh, which we can cover by hydro. It may be more than that, of course, uh, but uh, this is uh, how to put it in the most extreme way to see the worst case scenario. Uh, so what do we do with the excess of wind and solar? Uh, we can power the transport, uh, which is not a huge addition to legacy electricity demand. Uh, we can also electrify heating and uh, do most of our heating, either direct uh, heat pumps directly in homes or even better through district heating. And around half of electricity will still be excess. And this electricity we can use uh, for producing hydrogen, uh, which we can use uh, either in industry or as a precursor to different uh, uh, tran uh, heavy transport fuels. Uh, going to the modeling, uh, I started with climate, uh, went to the energy systems, and obvious first choice is to look at integrated assessment models. Uh, we have six uh, current integrated assessment models, which are used by IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and uh, most of them end up uh, pushing quite a lot of carbon capture and storage. But uh, this technology is not really happening. Nobody is developing it. Coal is dying and nobody developed CCS. So uh, obviously there is something wrong with uh, EMS. Uh, what is wrong? EMS cannot model variable sources because they do not model system integration. Uh, so simply, EMs are uh, wrong, and uh, the only solution they have, they push a lot of CCS uh, into the system. So we have a uh, Horizon Project Locomotion, in which we are developing uh, a new EM, William, and this one will be first that will be able to calculate 100% variable renewable energy uh, system. Uh, it's a very, very complex task because uh, EM doesn't have uh, proper time resolution uh, because it uh, tends to model everything. And modeling everything means you cannot go uh, into the uh, temporal detail enough in order to capture uh, variable renewable uh, sources. So how do we actually resolve uh, the variability of uh, uh, renewables? Of course, we need more grid uh, interconnections. Uh, we need to flexibilize thermal power plants in uh, a transition period. Uh, we need wholesale market coupling to make it uh, cheaper. But the most important thing we need is demand response and integration of power, heating, cooling, transport, water systems, so-called power to X. Uh, and this is the complicated part. Uh, we will, of course, be using dedicated electricity storage, uh, but that one is rather expensive and uh, we should use it as the last resort. So uh, let me uh, try to illustrate what happens when you put, let's say, only 25% wind and 25% solar uh, in a typical uh, Southeast European energy system, which is uh, made of base load, which can be either coal or nuclear. And then you have middle and peak load, which is gas and uh, hydro. Uh, so solar is pushing these uh, thermal power plants out of the, uh, the merit order during the day, and wind is pushing them during the night. What do we do with these excesses of, uh, uh, of electricity? Well, uh, we can sell them somewhere, we can store them, or the best the thing to do for climate is not to produce them. Um, let's see what uh, happens to the price. Uh, this is from 2016, so quite different from now. Uh, but it shows how electricity is usually falling down, electricity prices falling down when you have 
excess of solar and excess of wind. Uh, and uh, often the price used to be under 20 euros per megawatt hour, uh, uh, which means that electricity is cheaper on the heat basis than biomass, which means electricity can be easily used for heating. Now, the prices are much higher, going to 200. Uh, but this is a temporary uh, problem with uh, gas uh, supply, I would say. And uh, once we solve it, uh, the price will probably stay very high uh, in morning and evening when we don't have enough renewables to cover all the demand. While in the night and in the day, uh, by building more and more renewables, uh, this is going to uh, uh, fall down and we will have very uh, cheap electricity uh, because of the so-called uh, duck curve problem. Uh, so we have lots of electricity in some parts of the day and a lack of electricity in other parts of the day. And we should be seeing a huge difference uh, in uh, price uh, during the day. So uh, current modeling uh, softwares are usually made for 20th century system in which supply was following demand. Uh, but the 21st century energy system is a completely different animal. Uh, it's when demand follows supply, because supply is something that uh, depends on the weather, uh, wind and solar. Uh, and we have to uh, uh, change our demand so it can actually fit the supply. For that, we need smart energy systems. And... Uh, when we come to the heat and how we can use heating system in order to make a smart energy uh, system, uh, there is this uh, nice example of Skagen uh, district heating. This is now being used in uh, many more places. Uh, when the electricity price, it is the pale uh, green line is high, uh, then cogeneration units uh, are, are on and they produce electricity, sell it on the market and also produce heat, the red line, uh, and store it in a heat storage. When electricity price is uh, zero or negative, uh, the excess of electricity appears, maybe and most probably because of uh, wind and solar are uh, marginal technologies and electric boilers, orange, are uh, turned on and they produce uh, heat. Um, uh, this is the way we can uh, uh, connect power and heating system. Of course, in future, uh, we will prefer mostly the heat pumps. Uh, there are also examples of heat pumps uh, uh, working on district heating, but heat pumps need a bigger number of hours in order to pay back uh, investment. So electrical boilers may be an uh, initial option for your district heating system. So uh, if we look at the uh, potential of integration of wind uh, into the power system, in a conventional power system, we should look at uh, the black line, uh, which means more wind we integrate in the power system the higher critical excess of electricity uh, production is, meaning that this is electricity that we cannot integrate in the system and we have to basically curtail it. So at around 5% of CEP, um, our further integration of wind uh, becomes uh, uneconomical. So we can easily integrate up to 20% of uh, of uh, 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 wind power into the power system, but above that, uh, we are starting to feel economic pressures. If we add power to heat connection, uh, then we can easily go to 40%, uh, meaning we can double uh, the integration of wind just with adding this uh, link between power system and heat system. If we also electrify transport, we can go up to 80% uh, of, the, of the electricity can be covered by uh, uh, wind. Uh, only the remaining 20% is much more complicated. So we have uh, practically solved most of the problem with uh, integration of 
uh, power, heating, and the transport system into uh, one uh, system. But how do we model it? We need to have what we call flexibility options. Uh, you have to be able to model flexibility options. You have to have a possibility of having a flexible demand, which will mostly be industrial demand, which can be moved in time. Uh, you have to be able to model flexible thermal power plants because they are existing. Most of German uh, coal power plants are now cycling power plants, turning off and on twice a day. Uh, we also have to be model uh, 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 be able to model power to heat with thermal storage, uh, heat pumps to district heating and cooling, and individual heat pumps. We need to be model uh, be able to model smart charging and vehicle to grid. Uh, also, hydrogen production uh, plus electrofuels production uh, from uh, renewable hydrogen. Uh, and various uh, energy storage technologies like uh, batteries, uh, pumped hydro storage, molten salt storage, rock bed storage, uh, KS, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, here are electricity storages. Thermal storage is uh, another type of storage. But since we have very high demand for heating, 40% of uh, our final energy demand is for heating in Europe, so uh, we need a lot of heating, and it makes sense to store excess electricity into thermal uh, storage. So, uh, a short overview of uh, energy planning uh, tools uh, which can uh, model this integration, more or less. Energy plan was made for uh, this uh, power to heat uh, modeling uh, integration. Uh, heat storage is uh, two orders of magnitude cheaper than electricity storage. That's why uh, we want to use uh, this option as the best option uh, to store energy. This is the cheapest option. It doesn't work in tropical countries always if you don't have to do heating and cooling. Uh, but in many places like Singapore and uh, Dubai, where you do uh, uh, use maybe 40% of your final energy demand for cooling, it's perfect. We did model that and it works uh, very well. Energy plan is doing just one year simulation. Um, so we decide to develop our own software, H2S, which we hope to make uh, open source. We will present it in Dubrovnik at Zdeves conference. It has power and heating integration like all sector integrations. And it uh, does calculate long-term optimal addition of new capacities. Uh, then you have Plexus. Uh, it can model power and heat integration, but is mainly made for power modeling. Uh, it does calculate long-term optimal addition of new capacities. And then uh, we also used uh, this set, uh, which is uh, mostly power system. Uh, it's good for multi-zone modeling. Uh, it has long-term optimal addition of new capacities and power to heat is currently being uh, developed. Uh, then you have uh, various models like Leap, uh, Markal, Times, Osmosis, uh, which do long-term uh, uh, modeling of the energy systems. They're very good for demand developing, but not so good for the supply integration. So when we come to heat uh, demand modeling, uh, we have to uh, model useful energy demand uh, based on socioeconomic elasticities and not the final energy demand. Because uh, if we do final energy demand, then we cannot model energy efficiencies. Uh, and then based on the density of useful key demand selection uh, uh, should be made, do we uh, supply this uh, heat demand by heat networks of indi or, or individual systems? Uh, for that, we need GIS models. And then we need to model uh, power to heat linkages like CHP, heat pumps, electric boilers, and of course, uh, heat storage. Uh, when we look on the side of uh, heat supply modeling, we have to model waste heat from industry, uh, from CHP, uh, then geothermal heat, solar heat, 
uh, biomass heat, heat pumps, all kinds of heat pumps, resistance heating, and of course, uh, uh, incumbent uh, fossil fuel heating uh, systems. Uh, if we look at uh, the Breyer uh, paper, which is one of the possible solutions for the full uh, decarbonization of the global system, uh, he sees a lot of solar battery systems in the solar belt, meaning tropical areas and subtropical areas. But in Europe, we need to do the technology mix because we don't have uh, solar systems during the day. Uh, during the winter, uh, and we have uh, heating. So uh, heating helps very much integrating uh, these variable uh, resources. Uh, so uh, we still have uh, some issues uh, uh, to, 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 to solve. Uh, politically, uh, the road freight uh, will maybe be electrified roads, maybe e uh, fuels, shipping and aviation will need the e-fuels, high temperature processes will need hydrogen, uh, we will need probably hydrogen for winter windless weeks, so we can do it with biomass, uh, and uh, this makes around 20% of energy demand, and maybe half of that could be used by, uh, covered by biomass, and the other half uh, will be explained by Eva, who is the next uh, speaker. Uh, we did the calculation for Southeast Europe. This is open, uh, so open access uh, paper. And we calculated how much uh, 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 renewables we need to make everything renewable and how much uh, power to heat uh, integration is necessary. I will not go into details with number, but uh, the primary energy uh, demand will fall to half because renewables are more efficient and uh, nearly half of these uh, uh, primary energy uh, sources will go to electrolyzers. Heat pumps and electric heating will uh, take a minor part because electric heating is so much more efficient and also we will insulate most of the houses hopefully by uh, 2050. The blue part is the legacy electricity demand. You can see uh, the total uh, primary energy demand will be uh, some like four times higher than currently. And it will mean a lot of wind, uh, solar and uh, uh, hydro also. Unfortunately, in Slovenia, there is no wind and in Croatia, there is no uh, solar energy. So uh, we will have problems, but maybe we manage to uh, persuade our government, that there is wind and solar energy. So concluding, wind and solar are coming, but difficult to integrate. Integration of power, heating, cooling, water, transport system is necessary. Smart energy systems should be cheap and simple. Uh, we need to model full hourly time series uh, when we want to integrate variable renewables. Uh, and the typical day and worst case approach will not give uh, optimal uh, solution. Uh, such issues are disc uh, discussed a lot on Sdeves conferences. We are starting uh, on Sunday, the one in Dubrovnik, and there, are, uh, there will be three next year in 22. And I hope to uh, see you in one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Duic. As I mentioned uh, in the chat section, uh, we will have opportunity to make a couple of questions uh, on after each presentation, depends on the time schedule. And we have one question uh, from uh, Mr. Galinis. Why Markel and Times models are not suitable for modeling of system integration? What arguments do you have? Why, why they are better for demand side modeling versus supply side? Uh, well, we did... Uh, um I did uh, uh, work as consultant on um, uh, trying to improve market modeling in one country. Um, and the problem uh, we encountered that, uh, uh, of course, Markal can do it, uh, but uh, using 8,760 hours time series for each year uh, makes it nearly impossible to, uh, to work with that. Um, so uh, it's not really that simple to make it, uh, and we never actually managed uh, to uh, uh, to do the full time series long term calculation. Uh, 
Uh, this may be solved uh, in future, but currently Markal times are using um, a typical day approach, uh, which is not good for uh, uh, system integration. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, one uh, question. You are a visioner, and my question would be, if you imagine 2040, maybe 2035, what will we do on a dark and cold winter afternoon? How we will cover our electricity and heat demand? Well, obviously, at that time, uh, uh, for power system, we will still keep quite a lot of uh, natural gas bo uh, uh, combined cycle uh, plants, which will work only for such uh, uh, moments. They will probably, at that time, still be working a few hundred hours per uh, week. Uh, in uh, 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 2030, we will probably start to increase significantly the amount of hydrogen, <laughs> hydrogen uh, that will be produced. Uh, so slowly going towards 2050, uh, we will be using this uh, hydrogen as a backup. But then you have hydro, uh, which will... Uh, have to change in a way that uh, we will prefer to run it when uh, we have lack of uh, wind and solar. Um, so uh, hydro is something to be counted on in Southeast Europe and in Northern Europe as an important solution for the uh, uh, windows, uh, uh, winter windows uh, weeks. Uh, but they are not so usual. I looked at three years uh, time series uh, from 2018 and to 2020 and wind was never under 10%. So obvious solution is let's build uh, 10 times more. But even then we will need backup for sure. Ah, the heating, I didn't answer, yes. Um, uh, so uh, this is the crucial thing, uh, uh, why we need thermal storage. And we need a lot of thermal storage because wind has weekly uh, periodicity uh, and um, the optimal uh, heating storage is around four cubic meters per dwelling uh, if we want to run on uh, renewables only. Uh, so this is uh, one possible solution uh, to this question. Another possible solution is to have hydrogen uh, boilers uh, but uh, heat storage for uh, hydrogen boilers for peaks, uh, but heat storage is hugely cheaper. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Duic. Uh, we will have you also on the roundtable this afternoon and we'll be able to, to uh, make more challenging questions uh, like this one. Now I would like to pass uh, the floor to Dr. Eva Rijansko, Associate Professor in Energy Planning and Renewable Energy Systems from Aalborg University in Denmark. Uh, she is focused on electrofuels, power to X, pathways for liquid and gaseous fuels, and her research is based on a smart energy system approach and uh, for achieving cross-sectoral integration. Uh, she will have a presentation uh, with the title Power to X as a Sector Integrator Enabler. Uh, Miss Eva, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Do you see the right screen? No, I'm a bit... Uh... Not there it is. Just, uh, on, on, you, yeah, this is yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you, uh, Nevin, for uh, making the floor ready. Uh, there will be some repetition, but uh, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't really matter because this is something that we need to all uh, accept in the transition towards the future uh, energy systems. I'll focus more on the power to X uh, for the transport use. Um, and let's uh, let's see what uh, what does that entail. When we are talking about the future energy systems, uh, we are talking about few solutions that are on the table. Um, 
we are talking about the need for interconnectors and trading. Uh, and of course, a lot of investments are going to be made there and they are certainly necessary. Uh, the question is to what extent uh, they should be uh, made. Of course, another option is uh, that we need to use a flexible electricity demands and we need to integrate smart electricity grids because obviously in the future energy systems, electricity is going to be the main part uh, of the system. But however, we also need to talk about something that are integrated efficient smart energy systems, which are bringing all different sectors together and trying to establish the cross sectorial solutions uh, to enable the flexibility. If we are looking on the very simple energy system, uh, basic energy system, all the flexibility uh, in the system is on the resource side. So if we need to uh, deliver more of our demand, we are using more fuels. Uh, however, if we are talking about the future energy system, we lost the flexibility on the resource side. And now we need to establish the flexibility somewhere else. And the establishing of flexibility within the system calls for something that are called smart energy system. And smart energy system are a concept that were developed uh, in my research group uh, by the head of the research group, Henrik Lund. Um, and they are trying to uh, explain the cross-sectorial uh, connections by implementation of three smart grids. So not only smart electricity grids, but also smart heat grids and smart gas grids. And there are many uh, ways uh, of uh, establishing this by different types of uh, technologies that can be implemented. And if you look into how the graph or how the flow chart for the smart energy system looks and just to be clear, these are very simple illustrations, but you can see in the middle, uh, there are also electrofuels or power to X. So there are different technologies in the middle in the conversion and exchange and storage that are now going to be, have to be introduced in the future energy systems to enable this flexibility that has been lost on the fuel side, because now we have, of course, a lot of variable uh, renewables in the system and not to forget the bio, bio energy as a stable uh, input but the one that can be depleted. Interestingly enough, uh, what happened from 2012, where uh, we introduced the smart energy concept, um, in 2020, finally, the e European Commission has uh, announced EU energy system integration strategy that basically agrees on the research that have been going for many, many years that we need to have an integrated energy systems in the future in order to uh, achieve the transitions that we want to uh, head to. And one of those uh, connections are the cleaner fuel systems for hard to electrify sectors like uh, industry, uh, heavy industry, and of course, transport. What is the burning trend platform? Uh, at least from my perspective, when I work with the power to X is that the power to X technologies, and I mainly mean the power to X technologies that are, can you, be used in the transport sector, they enable the integration of your renewables. And you could follow on the Nevin slides before how uh, the flexibility of the system and integration of renewables uh, becomes higher and higher uh, in the system as we introduce new technologies that can enable this. If you are looking at the transport sector, transport sector has been lagging behind in terms of reduction of CO2 emissions for many, many years. Um, the reason for it is because it's a very, very complex sector. We are talking currently about 30 uh, modes of transport. They are using oil, different oil products. 67% uh, of the emissions uh, from a transport are coming from a road transport. 26 of these uh, percent uh, are the heavy is a heavy duty transport. Then we also have a marine and of course a civil aviation. So these are parts of the transport where we were struggling for many years to find uh, adequate solutions. And of course, uh, for you that know uh, what the solutions were on the table, uh, it became a bit clear that these are not going to be the solutions that can help the full transition uh, of the transport sector in the future. Uh, power to X as enable or opening a door for uh, fuel storage from electricity to, to fuels. Uh, they can optimize the utilization of our energy production and they are uh, able to displace the, the fuels uh, for the parts of the transport that cannot be electrified. 
Um, and we have we agreed finally that electrification uh, is the way to go. Uh, and you should never forget that if whatever you can electrify, you should electrify because this is the best way and uh, the most efficient way uh, to deal uh, with uh, transport sector as of other sectors as well. But we can electrify, fully electrify the personal transportation, the cars, uh, also. Uh, railways and parts of the uh, heavy duty transport, but most of it, uh, especially the aviation marine uh, and the long haul uh, transportation needs some kind of alternative uh, fuels that can be produced by power to X technologies. Current barriers that uh, we can hear for many actors that are interested in investing uh, in these technologies, uh, there are regulatory uh, framework inhibitors uh, that prevent a sound uh, business case. Uh, this is primarily because of different, uh, uh, the prices of electricity and the way that currently in the regulatory framework, you need to uh, be uh, connected uh, to the existing grid or the way that you uh, need to purchase the electricity uh, on the market, which is not necessarily including all the taxes that are not necessarily the best uh, if you are talking about storing the electricity uh, in the form of uh, liquid or gaseous fuel. Um, of course, there are some uh, effects that we need to be tested on a large scale. Uh, some of the, depending on what type of uh, end fuel or uh, are we talking about different end fuels or dropping fuels that we're using, uh, fuel engines and infrastructure need to be adjusted. Um, but most importantly, we need to create a competitive renewable fuel market. We are talking about how these uh, renewables or alternative fuels are more expensive than uh, fossil alternatives. You should never uh, think that these fuels are going to be cheaper. They can become cheaper if we have a sound the regulatory framework around it that can support it. But we need to talk that we need are lacking currently the renewable fuel market. So we cannot compete directly uh, with the fossil uh, due to a lot of sub subventions, but also because these are complex fuels uh, that are not necessarily the most efficient in the production process. And also because the transport sector is quite uh, complex, it's wise to talk about different targets for different modes of the transport, for the personal transport, road heavy duty transport, marine and aviation. The power to X pathways uh, can uh, uh, represent many uh, different ways to go. Uh, we can go from bioenergy resources with addition of hydrogen. The, the, the main uh, connection between these pathways is that you have the hydrogen that is converted uh, from uh, renewable electricity via electrolysis processes, and you can then add this hydrogen uh, to a different uh, pathways in order to produce fuels. Either you start from bioenergy resource where you yield uh, more of the end uh, fuel production by adding the hydrogen. Uh, you can start from the source CO2 source, either for the point source or air capture source, or you can go with the nitrogen uh, as a solution to produce ammonia uh, that doesn't uh, emit uh, CO2 emissions. The individual technologies are actually more advanced than generally presumed. Uh, and this is all, always tendency, of course, because this is not necessarily something that was shown uh, currently on, on a large scale, even though uh, there are uh, production facilities on uh, Greenland, for example, and also just a launch uh, facility in uh, Germany to produce jet fuels. Uh, we are power to X. Um, but the concept of integrating this on a large scale, of course, uh, remains to be proven and also connection uh, to the whole energy system. From a modeling perspective, this seems to have a really, really good impact uh, on the system and talks uh, well uh, in the conversion towards 100% uh, renewable systems. The reason why these technologies are very interesting is because if we look at different storage comparison, we know that the electricity storage is the most expensive type of storage. Um, well, while we head towards the liquid fuels, the price uh, become uh, cheaper. And also uh, the volume of storage uh, becomes uh, become smaller. So the opening door to the liquid and gas fuel storage also opens the door for the cheap uh, storage. But how do we need to use these storages in the long term? And so we talk about uh, different types of grids. Uh, I mentioned smart electricity grids, smart thermal grids, smart gas grid. We need to use the electricity storage for the transport. We need to integrate more district heating with the large scale heat storages. Uh, we need heat pumps to large 
tail heat pumps, but we need also high capacity electrolyzers. Um, we need uh, interest. If, if you look at the operation and uh, even talk a lot about the modeling, uh, I know normally sit with energy plant tool uh, that was uh, also mentioned. Uh, if we model electrolysis uh, in the future energy system, their operation time is around 50% if we want to enable the maximum flexibility. Not only that their operation is 50% of the time, the demand for electricity to produce these fuels for the future are also around 50%. So we are not talking about storing the excess electricity anymore. We are talking about dedicated investments in new renewable um, resources in order to be able to produce uh, the green gases and e-fuels that we need. And of course, we also uh, can use bioenergy uh, on the input side as the only fuel flexibility that we uh, have in the system. The cost of uh, power to X technologies are very interesting if you look uh, through the literature. And of course, I'm academic, so I scan uh, uh, published uh, peer review articles. Um, the span is huge. Um, the reason for it is uh, that uh, there are many different assumptions you can make. There are different electricity prices you can make. There are different concepts that uh, you can test uh, uh, and integrate in different models or also just uh, in a small uh, calculations. There are different fuels and fuels that you can head to uh, from dropping fuels to methanol, uh, DME, fissure traps, uh, of course, uh, fuels. Uh, so, so there are different assumptions that uh, can uh, show uh, and result in the, this uh, huge uh, gap between the costs. If we look into our analysis, in most cases, these fuels are two to three times more expensive. Um, and to reach the gap between those uh, uh, differences in the cost with the fossil fuels, uh, we can use different type of uh, incent incentives, but we can also just start uh, using uh, a CO2 uh, as a starting point and then um, tax the uh, fuels based on uh, how much CO2 uh, footprint they have. Current plans for power to X in Europe, but these also include uh, not only the, the different um, hydrocarbon or complex fuels uh, for, for the transport, but also just hydrogen. On the member state level, uh, they are uh, currently at 28.3 uh, gigawatts. Uh, the EU uh, national uh, EU hydrogen strategy set up the target for 40 gigawatts uh, by 2030. If we focus on the liquid or gaseous fuels that are not hydrogen, uh, they are mentioned uh, in few, some countries for uh, options for aviation and shipping. Um, and uh, for sure in the new published hydrogen strategies, we do expect that there are going to be more mentioned because the you know, revisions of the Renewable Energy Directive uh, to have actually set up the targets for these fuels for 2030. So I expect that the, they are going to be more and more mentioned uh, in the future published uh, strategies uh, for sector integration and also for, for hydrogen. If we look at about the projects that are commissioned uh, before uh, or should be commissioned before 2022. And I actually uh, need to update this graph. So they're not necessarily completely uh, correct in terms of capacity, but in terms of countries that are on the map, uh, the, uh, the, the picture remains uh, the same. Uh, we are talking about uh, many years, for many years investments in Germany in um, power to hydrogen and also power to methane. Um, uh, we have the facilities in Iceland producing methanol. Uh, we have a facility uh, in Norway uh, and the Netherlands they're announced to produce jet fuels and also uh, Germany uh, focusing, switching focus uh, towards uh, jet fuels um, in the in the future announced um, uh, projects and also the one that has just been integrated. So we are uh, in uh, the dark blue uh, mark uh, country, uh, Denmark, where I sit and work on a daily basis, uh, has announced more than three gigawatts of uh, new 
new power to liquid uh, projects uh, focusing on ammonia and on jet fuel. So right now uh, there is a boom of interest in uh, from industrial actors uh, in Denmark uh, on this technology. And why is Denmark uh, an ideal test bed uh, or laboratory for large scale electrolysis? We actually have uh, made a plan uh, and I can see that now uh, the screenshot on the, on, on the right for the report is actually in Danish. Uh, the report was made originally in English uh, and uh, further translated uh, to Danish. So you can uh, find the large scale uh, implement roadmap for large scale implementation of electrolysis in Denmark on my profile. Um, we made it in 2015 uh, and we try to argue why we can, uh, we should invest in large scale electrolysis in Denmark. Denmark is a very unique country, you could say there, uh, we already have a lot of uh, intermittent renewable uh, electricity in the system, we can uh, test uh, this by uh, implementing the technologies that uh, integrate uh, resource, intermittent resources, because we can predict the potential problems, you could say, uh, on the electricity grid side and also uh, from the resources side. Uh, there is a large share of district heating in, in Denmark uh, and utilization of waste heat uh, from fuel production processes that are uh, present can be uh, used uh, in the district heating network. There are plans for being 100% renewable in 2045, and there is a target in 2030 to have a 70% reduction of CO2 emissions. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, when I came here in uh, in 2011 to write my master thesis, uh, I was already very surprised why a country that has electrolyzer producers, that has a chemical synthesis producer, um, and uh, research in all these technologies is not necessarily focusing on this. But a lot of things happened from 2011 uh, to today. Uh, so actually, uh, the topic became uh, quite relevant in the last two years uh, on uh, not only for for, for the politicians, but also pushed by industrial actors. And there is a, always a, this question that I get, oh, you pay so much for your electricity in Denmark. Actually, when we look in the electricity production, Denmark has one of the cheapest uh, electricity production uh, already today. The reason why the price uh, for consumers are so high because we have a lot of taxes, and uh, then the price uh, is one of the most expensive in Europe. But because we have the cheapest electricity production and also large expansions of all offshore wind uh, plants that are already uh, uh, start being implemented and already been announced, uh, we can technically uh, have a dream to uh, be a fuel production plant for, for EU. Uh, and one of my... Uh, one of the uh, colleagues from the uh, hydrogen uh, network uh, try likes to say that Denmark potentially could be a uh, green Kuwait uh, of, uh, of EU. Uh, why not? The potential is there. Um, the important thing that we talk, and uh, in my group, we made a lot of plans for 100% renewable energy system, uh, not only in Denmark, uh, but for Denmark, we made a very uh, many, many studies, and uh, the new one just came out uh, this year uh, because of the targets in uh, 2030 and 2045 uh, to reach the carbon neutrality and 100% renewable systems. It's very important not to forget that what technologies we choose before 2030, they need to be technologies technologies that can help the further reductions in following years. We cannot stop thinking like we potentially, like we have done uh, before with the 2020 targets, especially in the transport sector, that we focus only on one point uh, in our timeline and not to think what are the consequences uh, to continuing this path. Because even though power to x not necessarily is going to have a big role in 2030, even though announced plans are higher than necessarily the ones that we have analyzed in some of the scenarios, they are going to be much needed towards 2045. So we need to start focusing on uh, these technologies and also try uh, to enable the, the regulatory framework to support the implementation. Um, apart from my uh, modeling, uh, uh, research I also uh, found very interesting uh, to look uh, how the actors are reacting uh, about these technologies because you know when you were sitting uh, for many many years with the models uh, and you simply 
uh, confirm your results uh, from one, uh, one analysis to another, you start wondering why is actually this not happening. Uh, so in one of the studies, we try to interview uh, on not only uh, academic experts, but also the experts from the industry that are involved uh, to some extent uh, in power to X uh, technologies. Um, and um, we did a study to try to see our uh, academics and uh, industrial actors align. And uh, surprisingly enough, or happily enough, they are uh, finally aligned in Denmark. And this is also the reason why we see that there is a push and progression of uh, uh, these technologies. Uh, not only they're aligned, they actually want to start uh, branding Denmark as a power to X knowledge hub. Um, and this is uh, for sure a step uh, that could potentially uh, enable uh, that power to x could be seen as a new industrial success story in Denmark as uh, the win uh, success story was uh, uh, as well. I will uh, finish here. Thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for, uh, for questions uh, now if there are some. Thank you, Eva, for your presentation. Uh, we do have one question, and the question will be made by Mr. Stane Marche uh, in the in the hall. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for excellent presentation. My question is: What do you uh, consider? Which electrofuel seems to be the most promising in this first decade until 2030? You mentioned that afterwards it will be even more interesting. But which, with which we should start? Hmm? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question and uh, very, very, very relevant and often asked. Um, and I think the tendencies right now that we can see also from uh, from the industrial side is that ammonia is going to play a role in the marine sector. Uh, Mask as the biggest shipping company and also Danish company for that matter has announced that the, they are going to want to use ammonia and also methanol in, in their uh, ships. Uh, they have uh, purchased uh, or have uh, ordered uh, ships from uh, MAN. Uh, their ammonia ships uh, should be uh, on uh, sailing, run and sailing in 2025. 20, uh, um, for uh, I would say ammonia methanol DME was tested by Volvo in Sweden uh, by because it can actually be run by uh, adjusting the uh, diesel engines. There is not a lot of talk about DME uh, at the moment, but I think actually it could be something that is going to be raised uh, up again. Uh, but I think these three uh, probably uh, are going to be, and of course the jet fuels. And currently there are, uh, the project in Germany is trying to uh, is an average like commercial small scale plan for trying to produce jet fuels. Uh, there, there is a lot of uh, interest in there is a project in Denmark to try to the, produce jet fuels from methanol. So go to the methanol as a as a middle uh, mediator because it can also be used uh, as that and then try to further convert it. So I think definitely ammonia and methanol are the prime prime spot fuels uh, for now when it comes to e-fuels. Uh, thank you, Eva. M maybe you might turn on your camera so people can see. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just... uh, my question would be, you mentioned uh, there will be a huge demand for investments in storages and for dedicated investments uh, for different technologies. What is the scale of these investments? Because apparently we are in the process of uh, having a, a, a new investment cycle and uh, this will be demanding in, uh, in area, for instance, for heat uh, storages. Uh, you mentioned that there is a four cubic meter of storage for, for a dwelling. So can, can you maybe comment on that? I have mentioned that. I haven't talked about the heat storages. Sorry? Oh, no, never mentioned. Well, but uh, in, in, in these investments in, in power to x sector, what, what is the level of investments uh, and who will be investing this? You mentioned that the European Commission is doing some integration of the energy systems. Yeah. And uh, what is your opinion on that? 
Yeah, the investments are going to be large now. I don't have uh, the, the numbers, but uh, we're talking about uh, billions and billions uh, of investments. Uh, who is going to invest? I think right now is trying, uh, the alignment needs to be clear about how to actually, uh, from a regulatory framework, to sound uh, these business cases. Because if we're, if we're looking about the cost structure in PowerJX technologies, a very, very large share, uh, share of the cost are, uh, is falling for the electricity. And if we're talking about purchasing electricity from the grid with all the taxes, this is simply becomes too expensive. So I think uh, the most important right now is that uh, industrial actors uh, get an access to a cheaper electricity by um, framework that can maybe exclude them for uh, paying uh, for the network tariffs uh, in times where uh, this is uh, this makes sense from the system perspective. So we're not. I'm not. I'm not necessarily arguing that we should eliminate the grid tariffs, but completely. But we should eliminate the grid tariff for electricity storage technologies uh, when uh, we have a lot of uh, wind in the system uh, and uh, and a lot of other renewables. Um, so I think uh, the, the the technologies right now are quite. Uh, uh, investment intensive and also in the future uh, our systems are going to be more investment intensive rather than fuel intensive. Uh, I can uh, send you uh, some studies to uh, uh, elaborate on the cost structures. Uh, I don't have right now the, the slide to show it, uh, but actually power to x technologies are one of the five top investment uh, investments in, in Danish energy system if we look uh, into 2045 and 2050. Yes, maybe another question which is uh, on the chat, uh, which factors mostly influence price differences? It is primarily the assumptions for electricity prices and also the, the end, uh, end fuel choices, uh, because from starting from hydrogen, uh, where you don't need a carbon source to produce fuel, to carbon source where you can either capture it from a point source or capture it from air capture, uh, that is also one of the uh, one of the cost uh, influences. But it's primarily the electricity uh, and what type of end fuel you need, and uh, do you need uh, CO two capturing or nitrogen capturing uh, to to uh, get the costs. Um, in the production chain. Well, thank you, Eva, for your uh, presentation and your answers. Uh, I wish we'll be able to to have you uh, in our uh, in in another uh, conferences and the discussion about this. And now I would like to uh, announce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Gaspar Stegner from Energy Efficiency Center at Josef Stefan Institute, will present the results of the Life Climate Path 2050 project. This is the project uh, which we are holding the final conference today. Thank you, Tomas, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. My name is Gaspar Stegner, and I'm coming from Jozef Stefan uh, Institute. I'm a, a member of the research team, research team that was uh, executing Life Climate Path 2050 project. Just a second. Just a second. We are experiencing some technical difficulties. Just a second, please. Okay. okay. Right. So uh, I will have. Uh, I will dig in deeper in one of the topic that Professor Duich was already talking about, and this is mainly about modeling of the heating demand in uh, throughout our life climate climate pro project, we have spent a lot of time uh, about dealing with modeling of the district heating. And today I will quickly guide you through the work that we have done and how district heating can be an important co contributor in the energy tr tr transition of the heating sector in Slovenia. And to, and to start with, Uh, why are we modeling heating demand and s a supply? As you probably know, 
of around 50% of our total energy demand in EU uh, accounts for heating and cooling, and only 22% uh, of those came from re renewable energy sources in 2019. And district heating in the future can have a considerable role uh, in e integration of local re renewable sources, sector coupling, and CO2 re reductions. It is important for the de decarbonization of our heating, se he heating sector. And uh, moreover, there is an extreme lack of knowledge in municipalities where the work is being executed. And if we, uh, and if we quickly transpo transpose our idea in nature, uh, even penguins know if they combine and bond each other together in a group, they heat together more efficiently. But what was our m motivation? What, was our, what were our research questions and background? So our main motivation was dealing with climate change. Change. We, we try to reduce CO2, optimize heat supply, and exploit our local p potential in Slovenia. And we dealt with questions, what could heat supply look like in Slovenia in 2050? To what extent can existing and new district heating networks contribute to, to, to energy transition? And moreover, what role can renewable energy sources in Slovenia have in the future? Uh, before the project Live Climate Patch, Climate Patch started, we already had some lo local projects that dealt with modeling of the district heating. And we had actually no data about district heating modeling on a micro level. So the, this project was, was, was actually a kickoff. So objectives th that we gave uh, ourselves were we wanted to create a Slovenian heat map uh, with a bottom-up approach. We tried to identify technical and economical p potential for the further exploitation of existing district heating grids, as well as identifying new areas where district uh, heatings could be economically feasible. Moreover, we try to de 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 determine exact locations and try to identify uh, to what extent re renewable energy sources could be f further exploited in that in those exact exact areas. So, what do uh, do, do do we model? Uh, since I'm the first member of our research groups uh, in this conference, I will quickly guide you through the models that we. Uh, that we made, that we dealt with. So the purpose of the, our models is to understand a specific segment and show how such uh, can affect so society, its uh, sociological components, economy, and environment. So model results are usually in a form of projections and scenarios. Results of the model must, uh, as such, reflect selected presumptions and the approximation that were used, which the, the designers of the model assumed in the planning. So these are uh, the six models that we mainly use in throughout our Climate Pet 2050 project. Uh, the main one that I will show you just a, a part of it today is called Res Slow. It's a reference. A energy and emission system model for Slovenia. And this picture shows you the integration of all models that were used throughout the live climate pet projects and how they combine between each other. Uh, Jozef Stefan Institute worked mainly on model RESLO, that is a central, uh, central model here, and it consisted in transposed, transposed the results from all, for, from all others. And the model for the district heating e exploitation is just a small part of the risk law model. So district heating model is necessary for the purpose of the heating demand and supply balance analysis. So for the created, uh, the created a model that I will show today in the scope of this project enables us to analyze possibilities for expansion and exploitation 
existing and new district heating networks and to identify areas where district heating at the moment is not present but could be a cost efficient option in the future. This is a unique uh, model that, that uses a bottom-up bottom -up approach and as such de derives from the, uh, from the actual condition of each building's condition in Slovenia. And the model is based on a Python pro programming code and can be as such replicated on, on arbitrary area. And it has several steps. So since uh, this is a bottom-up uh, model, uh, so we at first calculate the energy efficiency of each building in Slovenia. We intertwined several d databases that uh, show, uh, showed us how uh, energy efficient are our buildings. So uh, after that, after doing that, we uh, create, uh, created the heat map for the entire country that is shown on this picture. And since Slovenia he, is a very scarcely de, uh, populated areas, uh, the heat map shows exactly that. We have only uh, five bigger cities, so where uh, we, we have a slightly more densely populated, densely populated areas, the, the, the picture is darker. So, this is what uh, the heat map looks like on a macro level. And if we dig in a little deeper, on micro level for uh, a city of Maribor that is shown here, it looks like this. So darker colors are representing uh, an area of uh, 100 by 100 cell where heat demand is bigger and where this is an area where district heating uh, could be uh, one of the most most optimal solutions for heating. So this was the one of the first steps. N next up, we uh, we have to we had to evaluate our 100 district heating grids that are currently present in Slovenia, and each one of those has been specifically for the rest and buildings that, that are near the grid analyzed. Furthermore, we, uh, we try to identify how many buildings on those grids and networks are, are already connected to, uh, to, uh, to the grid and how many of them aren't. So, we, so as, as such, we identified the technical potential uh, for further exploitation on the existing grids. Next up, we presented several uh, approaches how to further expand the existing network of district heating. Uh, this is, uh, these images show uh, two options for the city of Maribor and, and Krajn, where we, where we would, uh, where with GIS tools had to uh, combine our results and approaches. Next up, we had to go from needs to heat our buildings to, to the supply options. Throughout our live climate pet project, we had uh, several special projects where we tried to identify uh, how, much, uh, how much energy can we exploit on, it, on the exact lo lo locations where the, uh, where the buildings are. And one of such uh, projects that is quite a successful story is a project where we try to identify how many uh, shallow ge geothermal energy can be exploited on the location and we uh, created a heat map of the potential for the exploitation of shallow geothermal energy for the whole country on, on the level of 100 by 100 uh, squares. Next up, uh, we, had, we had already uh, some projects re where we identify exact location for the solar potential as well. Uh, so when we had uh, all that, furthermore, we had to identify areas we, uh, where we where uh, uh, district heating could be further exploited, but is not. So we at first try to identify the technical potential. So identification uh, uh, by several conditions. So we identified areas where sufficient heat <laughs> demand is present uh, and is outside existing district heat heating 
infrastructure. So on the picture, with, uh, you can see in the blue color the city of Ljubljana uh, and where the district heating is currently present and could, and could be further expanded in the future. The green areas at the moment present areas where the heat demand is big enough so the um, creation of the district heating network could, could be, uh, but we don't know yet, could be a cost efficient option. Uh, so this was the main question th that we dealt with, not only uh, if the, if the uh, potential p uh, presents one of the solutions, but the main question, question was, is, it, is, is this a cost efficient solution? So we, we establish a methodology in, in two levels. Uh, where we identified, uh, identified economic feasibility of new district heating network. Uh, for the establishment of new district heating plant and grid, uh, we took methodology that, uh, that was already developed by the Horizon Projects Heat Roadmap Europe, uh, where as a result uh, in the in investment you get uh, you can get energy price uh, of the new district he heating grids. And as a final step, as a second uh, level to, uh, to check uh, cost efficiency of our model is that to try to check the competitiveness of the energy price with a life cycle cost a me a me a methodology where we compared uh, the energy price of the new district heating network with the cheapest and clean technology that is available in densely populated areas. This is a heat pump, heat pump air water. And in sparsely popul pop populated areas uh, with the bi biomass boiler as well. And we did that on a level 100 by 100 meters for the entire country. Uh, so this was one of the re results that we got. Uh, throughout, we got 95 areas in Slovenia where district heating could be uh, installed but is not yet. These are five, the biggest one in the, in, in the entire country. And despite the fact that uh, aggregate, despite the fact that aggregate e energy demand will decrease in, in the future uh, through uh, the extensive building energy re renovation until 2050 that is planned, uh, the approach enabled us to make uh, su suitability e analysis uh, from the, of the district heating from the economic aspect of existing and new district, uh, the district heating areas. So if we started out from the starting point where, we, where district heating is uh, to today, this uh, methodology enabled us to see where can we go, where district heating can be at in 2050. And we made several uh, scenarios with different intensities. Uh, and as such, we got from, we went from th theoretical, technical, economical to market potential. And to show you some of the main results that we got, uh, regarding general district heating potential, uh, larger buildings that are more interesting from the point of view of the cost effectiveness for the connection to district heating. So the analysis was uh, one part of that was mainly made only for building with usable areas for more than 400 square meters and it showed us that total heating needs for larger buildings represent only one third of the total needs for all buildings. This is, this is, this is almost three terawatt hours. And 90% 90 of those needs, or 2.6 terawatt hours, is located in a cell where density is, is greater than 100 megawatt hours per hectare. Uh, so furthermore, regarding the potential in existing district heating system, Taking into account the, the continuum of energy of, of of annual heat 
a demand density as a as a criterion for economic potential uh, the expansion of existing district heating grids is that is mainly connected by larger buildings we estimate the economic potential uh, for expansion between 150 gigawatt hours to 500 gigawatt hour in densely populated areas and despite a conservative despite a conservative estimate of the economic potential, the, this still is an increase from 12 to 40 percent of today's heat sales for heating of those buildings. And regarding the, the new district heating system that could be installed in Slovenia, 95 new potential areas were identified that cover a total area of 32 square kilometers and this is the, the estimated total annual heat demand p potential in these areas is uh, uh, more than 500 gigawatt hours and the estimated cooling potential here is 140 gigawatt hours uh, almost and we estimate today that economic potential for new district heating system for new areas is between 200 and 400 gigawatts gigawatt hours where the heating demand is greater uh, than 350 megawatt hours so this is like uh, a second generation of district heating potential and the entire methodology uh, that I presented can be further uh, seen and read in the paper in the energy journal that you can get on the on that link and this is everything from my side and I'm available for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you Gaspar for your presentation. Uh, since we don't have questions from the uh, online audience I would like to ask you about the approaches. If y you selected the bottom-up approach when modeling, uh, how is this combined or how can you uh, maybe uh, decide whether the top-down or bottom-up approach is better in some situation in which situation this can be uh, taken into account when modeling uh, basically really the bottom-up versus top-down approach for the building energy consumption yes uh, the entire approach was validated with uh, statistical data uh, so we calibrated the energy demand uh, for the uh, for the entire building sector with the uh, final energy use of that building and do it on the national uh, national uh, level and that and that uh, those data on national uh, level is being prepared by a statistical office of the Republic of Slovenia. And this is our way to calibrate the entire model. Okay, uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Maybe maybe to conclude uh, your, your presentation, uh, you mentioned that there will be a, a huge reduction of energy consumption in buildings in the future, so that uh, also the systems will reduce in sales. How does this affect the new district heating networks? greatly because uh, currently existing district heating systems in the future as such will not be economically feasible if they will not expand the, uh, those uh, networks because the heating demand of those uh, of those buildings will decrease and as such uh, energy price will probably st slowly st slowly increase so the only solution for the existing uh, district heating network operators is that they expand uh, those grids. So the energy price will stay probably roughly the same as it is today. Okay, thank you very much again. And uh, now I will announce uh, coffee break and uh, uh, networking uh, break. We will have uh, breakout rooms, the same as yesterday. There will be two breakout rooms, uh, new carbon neutral technologies and energy intensive sectors. On the right hand side in the chat section, you will see the instructions how to join breakout rooms. Uh, there will be two moderators uh, in each uh, of the rooms and you're welcome to join. 
uh, during the coffee break uh, we will have the coffee, uh, the net the breakout rooms uh, uh, open for approximately 30 minutes and then we will join again at 11:15 with lectures on the decarbonization of industry thank you very much and we'll see you in one hour time
Dear participants, we will continue the conference with lectures on the decarbonize, decarbonization of industry. Uh, we have three presentations in this session, and I would like to introduce to you the first speaker, Mr. Ravi Kantamanini, Senior Director of ISC, ICF Consulting, who has 20 years experience developing and implementing policies and programs that support the transition to a low-carbon economy, responsible for developing low-carbon growth and investment strategies, designing climate and energy policy program management and providing technical assistance to national governments, regulatory bodies and the private sector. His speech has a title, Modeling Challenges of the Decarbonization of Industry, Greenhouse Gas Emissions Projections for Industry. Uh, Mr. Ravi, the floor is yours for the presentation. Um, first, let me share my screen. Um, let's see, I'm trying to uh, upload my, <coughs> my, sorry, hold on. Can you, can you see that? No, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So yes, uh, pleasure to uh, pleasure to be here. And um, uh, um, as uh, as just introduced, um, I'm uh, my name is Robbie Cantamini, senior director of ICF, and uh, sort of discuss the the modelling approach that we have undertaken um, using our own model, the energy efficiency um, opportunities assessment tool. Um, just as a, <clears throat> just to start with um, a bit of context. Uh, so in 2017, um, uh, the industrial sector accounted for about 17% uh, of EU's, uh, the EU's emissions. And, and since 1990 has in effect been uh, reducing about 1.5% uh, per year. Generally, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good uh, trend. However, uh, the industry, industri industrial sector is probably the most expensive sector to decarbonize as it's extremely diverse technologically and operationally, even within the same sector and product category. Um, it's also technically challenging due to the need for heat and the use of fossil fuels as feedstock, as well as continuing economic issues uh, that most uh, sectors and subsectors are, are dealing with around margins, uh, low margins, uh, high capital costs, asset lifetimes, uh, which impact uh, the resulting uh, decisions about uh, purchasing new equipment or, or undertaking retrofits and such. So this, this area is of extreme interest um, and the reason behind uh, ICF developing its own uh, tool, the, as I mentioned, the, the EEOA, the Energy Efficiency Oper Opportunity Assessments Tool, which quantifies uh, or aims to quantify energy efficiency savings per sector uh, uh, and by potentially by member states, if, if modeled that way, and uh, to identify the energy savings opportunities with the highest technical and economic potential. Now, moving to the next slide, we uh, sort of briefly introduced uh, the concept. Um, now, the, our model um, <clears throat> starts off with developing a, a sort of a, a bottom-up. Um, it's a it's a bottom-up uh, assessment tool first by defining the business as usual, uh, final energy demand baseline for the pertinent sector. Uh, our model uh, covers four sectors, um, industry at a subsectoral level, for example, iron and steel, petrochemicals, refining, cement, uh, residential, tertiary, uh, which includes hotels and restaurants, um, health, education, public and private buildings and road transport. And specifically, the model is, is built on a database of several hundred energy efficiency measures. Uh, some have that, some of that have horizontal application across all sectors, while others are more vertically and focused on sector specific opportunities. So the next slide highlights some of the information captured within the energy efficiency uh, database around each measure, and that includes the uh, energy saving potential, uh, the availability of that technology, the lifetime, the, the first year that it can be made available. And this looks at whether it is an immediate opportunity or something with, uh, 
uh, a higher TRL, uh, technology read readiness level. So something that will likely come into play in 10 years time or 15 years time developing, de de depending on the level of uh, market availability, uh, capital uh, and operating costs. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the, the framework, it, sorry, let me just see if I've gone too far. Okay, sorry. So the framework itself, um, and apologies for the, um, the, the the small text here, but um, <clears throat> it has uh, <clears throat> uh, several several layers, starting as discussed with the, the business as usual, um, energy consumption projections, and the energy savings opportunities, which are applied to it based on technical capability. Um, and that is the proportion of the market that can that the technology or the, the energy efficiency measure can be applied to, uh, and its current and future market penetration potential, as well as the, the uptake profile. So, for example, in a very simple case, um, LED lighting, which is commonly available, and so the market penetration potential could be already uh, its market penetration could be around 80, 90 percent, and so the final market penetration could be not will be 100 percent within within the next few years. So it's something to that effect. So it's making some projection about when, um, how much of the technology is already in the market, and how much potential has it uh, further to go, and how will it, um, how will it enter the market and and progress um, <coughs> uh, through through the time period defined. Um, Furthermore, um, <clears throat> the high-level business, uh, uh, as usual, energy projection is disaggregated uh, to the sector facility level based on fuel mix profiles, which quantifies how much of the energy is used within a specific process. So it allows us to apply the specific uh, uh, measure to a, a specific process within a facility. Uh, and this flows through to determination of the technic, technical and economic potential. So the technical and economic potential, um, technical potential is the maximum savings opportunity that can be achieved regardless of cost, while the economic is based on a conserved cost of conserved energy methodology, which, uh, in, which includes the measures cost, its lifetime and discount rate. And then this is of course, compared to the energy savings to quantify its economic potential. So <clears throat> this, uh, this next slide here highlights the, um, the results of a study conducted for the, the European Commission. And um, I don't wanna get into too much detail on, on the, the specific numbers, but just highlight a couple of things which I think are quite pertinent for, for the industrial sector. And one is, uh, the low economic saving potential. And the economic saving potential modeled here was uh, with, with a two year payback. So it highlights, of course, the, um, uh, the, the, the expense, uh, as Nick mentioned earlier, the expensive aspect of mitigation in the industrial sector. And, and secondly, the high contribution of heat to these industries. Uh, so while decarbonizing the grid is important uh, and a key focus. Industry faces, of course, greater challenges to decarbonize heat, which is more bespoke as it's linked to a change in the in the process. Um, and as such, it's more reliant on broader innovations such as hydrogen as a, as a heat source or carbon uh, capture and utilization storage, so CCUS. Um, <clears throat> So this next slide highlights some of the, the immediate opportunities that sort of fall into that uh, two year payback economic potential um, and reflects uh, those that are currently available um, and potentially cost effective given the right circumstance. And, and these are all of course, uh, known, uh, known opportunities and uh, in, in the general context, I think quite, quite uh, quite recognizable and, and an obvious uh, solution. However, they're not always implemented. Uh, and these are linked to, linked to various technical and internal issues, which of course are harder to model. Uh, for example, if we look at exhaust gas heat recovery, um, 
Now, the technical constraints uh, include the you know, potential precipitation, uh, the accumulation of deposits of, uh, such as moisture on the surfaces uh, of the heat exchanger, which increases overall resistance to, to heat flow. Um, there's the, the, the corrosion risk, um, inefficient heat transportation networks, so the, the ability to uh, supply that heat throughout the facilities depending on, on many factors, including the length of piping, the thermal connectivity of the insulation, and of course, um, uh, the pipe diameters, all, all factors which, of course, uh, complicate modeling and, and the true uh, potential uh, available. Um, and furthermore, the, the intangibles uh, at, a, at a more um, industry or facility specific level, um, factors such as capital availability to undertake the investment, um, hidden costs associated with the investment, risk, um, which uh, for which impact decision making, such as a potential for equipment failure or accidents associated with new technology, um, which are known as I guess residual risks and and cannot be completely mitigated and uh, and is often uh, covered by insurance uh, <clears throat> to to most to to uh, uh, in most cases. Um, there's the low status of energy efficiency within, of course, current uh, decision making and within the facility general inertia or bounded rationalities, which um, sort of relates to the, the need to play it safe um, and the natural tendency to rely on established and familiar assumptions, and therefore the inability to, to make a leap into in something new, uh, imperfect evaluation criteria differing, leading to uh, resulting from dis different facts or perceptions or biases within within uh, industry or within um, operations, and general and linked to this competencies and awareness. So um, internal skills and competencies are competencies to interpret information on, on new energy efficiency opportunities, how they make impact the business and and operations. And of course, this this is uh, secondary aspects, which of course uh, are generally difficult to model, which also ultimately impact. Um, the, the ability of the industry to, to decarbonize effectively and, and, uh, and, and lead into some of the, the potential policy measures that need to be developed and generated to support industry moving forward. So with that, um, let, me, let me close. Um, I'm open to, to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Ravi. Uh, I would like to make uh, the first question. Uh, you mentioned uh, the difference uh, between the economic and technical potential in industry. We could see that uh, the technical uh, potential was like 24% in iron and steel, but the economic potential only 46 How does this reflect with this new higher material costs of, uh, of uh, raw materials, of uh, energy costs and how this can be included in your models? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. So um, <clears throat> so this study was, uh, of course, a few years ago and it reflects, I guess, 2030 projections. Um, right now, that's a, that's a two year payback um, and generally was aiming to reflect current business cases, how, how industry and annual plans and, and decision-making takes place and, and to reflect, I guess, the disparity between the ability of industry to, to pick up and, and implement measures. Um, of course, that will change, uh, that, that payback will change if uh, fuel prices increase uh, and therefore the energy savings um, tip the balance in terms of increasing um, the um, uh, reducing the payback period. And that's the ultimate uh, opportunity here. So as costs for fuel supply and materials, uh, well, if, as fuel supply primarily, because that's the metric we've, we've been using, will increase, um, that, will, um, that will lower the payback period. But of course, material aspects, um, as that increases, the cost of new technology will likely increase as well. So it's it's a, it's a difficult uh, conundrum, and I think for the, for most cases, um, a, a difficult a difficult issue for industry to, to face, especially as decision making is, is naturally very short term across the commercial sector. 
um, and to to plan for the, the low carbon transition and, and now 2030 or 2050 targets will take a shift, a paradigm shift in, in how business operates and how how business models are looked at and managed um, to to take in um, these these longer term objectives and and it's a difficult uh, difficult ask for industry and 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 this is where policy policy will need to come in and provide some certainty and some potential support uh, to to help that uh, that um, that transformation. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? We have a question from uh, Mr. Gnezda from, um, from Umanotera. Uh, can the technicians please turn on uh, the microphone of Mr. Gnezda? Mr. Gnezda, can you, uh, can you, yeah. have can you hear yeah. me? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah, hi, every uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Ravi, perhaps it's off topic, but maybe if he could answer what would, in his view, be the best policy currently in the EU uh, that encourages industry towards decarbonization. So basically, which member state has the best, in, most encouraging policy currently in place for decarbonizing industry? Um, I, don't, uh, I don't have that... Um, um... I don't have the details, I guess, of how different member states are handling industrial uh, decarbonization uh, at the policy level. Um, uh, <clears throat> I've knowledge of certain countries, but not all of them, so I can't necessarily pick out what the best one is. Uh, I guess all I can say is that the, um, at the EU level, there is, of course, you may be familiar with the Fit for 55 a package of proposals that are coming out, um, which will have, um, I think, quite a bearing on how member states will respond or need to respond. And currently, right now, it's as you as you may be aware, there's a it's a mixture of directives and regulations. And uh, directives, of course, um, uh, mean that member states will have to transpose that into their current, uh, you know, into their current um, regulation. Whereas, you know. Your commission regulation, of course, directly needs to be abided to, and and so um, you're, you're seeing, for example, with the ETS um, now with the uh, the the, um, the reduction uh, per year now increasing from 2.2 or being proposed to increase from 2.2 to to 4.2 percent per year that will have an impact on industry in terms of what it needs to be doing. Um, the the cost of carbon will likely increase which will um, provide another incentive for, for industry to, to, uh, um, to um, manage the, the, uh, the looking at efficiency and, and optimization of, of uh, how, how it operates. Um, linked to that, there are of course other, um, other proposals out there, potential extension um, of the of the ETS to cover uh, road transport and buildings again that will uh, play into how industry and, and their supply chain operate the uh, the renewable is uh, in the, the RE, RED um, uh, red is being re um, reviewed and upgra upgraded so there's a lot there's a lot of policies there um, even the alternative fuels, uh, infrastructure directive, which is going to become a regulation, which looks at hydrogen and and setting up the infrastructure um, to to support the expansion and use of hydrogen. These are all quite interlinking directives, with the primary aim to ensure the fifty five percent target by twenty thirty is achieved. So, at a, at the European level, that's just being looked at, but that will start filtering through into member states and have an impact on how member states look at industrial decarbonization. So I, I do expect that there will be some changes to how member states operate or, or member states are looking at industry uh, and the policies that support industry in the next, uh, next few years. Uh, we have a question. You can also read it in, in the chat section. Uh, Ms. Urbancic is asking, do you expect significant structural changes in industry and production consumption patterns caused by relatively energy prices and other factors? And what is the assessment of these expected effects? 
Um, I, qualitatively, I, I do think um, there will be um, quite a quite a change. Um, how long that will take is is the big is the big question. Um, there are you know various um, industrial strategies. The, the EU has has their uh, uh, decarbonisation strategy. I know the, the UK has also already developed theirs, and it's it's focused around trying to develop sort of industrial clusters where there are uh, potential opportunities to improve savings and uh, optimization of, of resources. Uh, it also uh, it looks at the, the need for carbon capture storage to support industry and, and specifically those processes that, you know, cannot be easily uh, mitigated uh, and where, of course, uh, you know, fossil fuels still need to be used. That's uh, that's a quite a, a broader infrastructural play, and uh, you know some of these are, are likely, uh, some of these will occur outside industry, um, the infrastructure needed to support industry to make this transition. So it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one to say, um, and who of course will bear the cost for that, uh, but it will be needed, and I think that will it will play a role with supply chains. Um, and I, I guess more broadly, I know we're talking about industry, but you know that the pressure that is being generated across the financial sector um, and consumers and, and regulators is, is just increasing. So importantly, the financial sector, the you know the the pool of money that will be made available for greener investments is increasing significantly, um, and so the cost of of loans, I think, for um, inefficient processes, inefficient industries will increase um, because of concerns around stranded assets and such. So there will be um, there will be knock-on effects, and this and this will lead, I think, to to industry needing to 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 make those changes. Again, I, I can't speak to how long that will take, but I think it's um, it's it's quite a it's it's not an industry specific issue. I think it's a it's it's a holistic um, societal issue, and you and you're seeing it across, you know, um, resi residential tertiary sector. It's road transport. It's it's industry, um, and and it will impact supply chains and and you know the logistics and the material the materials being used. So so yeah, I I. I I think we will see big changes, but um, whether and and COP twenty six will be will hopefully provide uh, a bit of um, uh, pointer to to what that will look like and what's expected. Uh, when you mentioned that uh, you have uh, discussed uh, for industry 200, 210 measures and you have uh, selected these measures according to their potential availability, life and so on, maybe the question on CAPEX and OPEX, uh, do you think that there will be any significant changes uh, in, in this level in, in the technologies in the future regarding CAPEX and OPEX? Oh, definitely, definitely. Nothing is nothing is ever static, um, and some some costs will decrease, some will increase, depend, depending primarily on, you know, material issues, material availability. Um, as as innovation uh, develops, uh, there is a lot of finance uh, investment going into innovation. To uh, and as new technologies come into the market and are picked up, then definitely costs will decrease, um, and if you're seeing um, a lot of money. So, for, for example, with the, the current fourth phase of the ETS, all the money that's generated through the ETS is going to, into support decarbonization uh, projects uh, with the aim to innovate uh, and develop new technologies um, and, or push technologies further towards market. So, uh, yeah, I, again, I think, I think for some technologies, what you'll see drops in, in, in price and, and costs. Uh, for some uh, new technologies, of course, they will be higher, but over time they will drop as well. Among those technologies that you have uh, already discussed, uh, do you expect or maybe do you already see some technologies which are emerging now and which has not yet been included in these uh, strategies? We expect that there will be technologies that currently we don't even know, but they will emerge in the next five to ten years because they will be the one who will lead us to the significant uh, reductions until 2050. 
Um, there, there are, uh, you know, a lot of ideas depending on the TRL, you know, the, the number of the TRL number of the, the innovation um, that are out there. Of course, some of them won't come to market. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, I guess, being tested. Um, I think the obvious ones are the ones that, you know, people are looking at, which is, for example, you know, biofuels, it's, um, it's hydrogen, it's uh, CCS. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of investment, there's battery storage, of course, and um, there's a lot of investment around that to try and um, uh, develop te technology, develop that to at least a uh, a cost optimal opportunity and, and maybe the, also the infrastructure to support it. Uh, in terms of a, a game changer, um, I don't think we'll see anything in the next five years, um, but who knows in terms of uh, potential breakthroughs that will occur in the next 10, 10, 15 years or, or beyond. Um, but at least in the short term through 2030, I, I don't see anything uh, uh, significant. Now, in terms of our database, this is being generated through, you know, side assessments that we've done or and literature. So it reflects, I guess, what's currently what we think is out there and, and what is potentially applicable to industry. If it is a technology that is um, just an idea, we we don't include it. Um, so again, it's it's focused on uh, the availability of the technology and uh, the potential for it to make an impact. Uh, my final question is uh, towards uh, heat. You saw that uh, you, you showed us that uh, there is a high potential of heat uh, in the in the industrial sector of around like 50 percent, and uh, this heat is nowadays somehow uh, used for various applications uh, for, for the waste heat. But there is always a problem in industry. Uh, they can always use the high temperature heat, but there is also a lot of low temperature heat. And this is a problem where to use it. What is the solution from those 200 options that you have? So as, as, as mentioned there, uh, I think the, the, low, the low temperature heat is, is, a, is a big problem. Um, uh, we have it classified as under, you know, exhaust heat recovery um, as a, as a, as an option. It isn't. Um, um, it's a tough one because I think, uh, as as mentioned, the technical challenges of utilizing it are are problematic um, and potentially costly at present. So it's not a. It's it's a huge potential, but again, it's not something that we've um, we've been able to effectively effectively model um, which is why you see the in, in, in effect the technical potential is still you know only 25 percent by 2030 um, and not necessarily higher well thank you very much uh, mr Cantamaneni, uh, for your presentation and for your answers uh, and uh, we hope to have you more uh, in, in conferences like this because this uh, industrial Part of uh, transition to carbon neutral economy is quite important uh, also for Slovenia. And uh, I will now uh, take the opportunity to announce the next uh, speaker, Mr. Uh, Mateusz Pushnik from Energy Efficiency Center uh, at Josef Stefan Institute, will present the results of the Life Climate Path 2050 project in terms of uh, industrial models and uh, potential for reduction in industry. <coughs> Hello everyone, thank you Tomasz for the introduction. Uh, my name is Mateusz Pushnik, I come from Josef Stefan Institute Energy Efficiency Center and I will present uh, the results of the Life Climate Path 2050 project for industry. Um, <coughs> Uh, you have heard uh, some words about the project. It's like uh, uh, somehow of a red thread throughout these uh, three days. Uh, just a few words about uh, about uh, the policy framework that uh, the uh, Slovenian long-term climate strategy uh, takes into account. Uh, the, there are three main pillars, as uh, already mentioned, also uh, during this. Uh, these days presentations, uh, Paris Agreement, um, the effort, the joint effort to limit the temperature growth by uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, 
Another important pillar is the regulation on governments of the EU Energy Union and Climate Action from 2018, uh, in which it is, it is stated that the EU must strive for a balance between emissions and sinks as soon as possible uh, and in the future establish net negative emissions. And another important pillar that uh, was taken into account uh, was the National Energy and Climate Plan, uh, uh, which uh, was taken into account by uh, when preparing long-term uh, climate strategy for Slovenia up to 2050. Uh, the goals of the Slovenian long-term climate strategy, the goal is to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, uh, on the right uh, in the table you can see the, the objectives in relation to the year 2005 for uh, different sectors. Um, in NECP, Slovenian NECP, uh, the reduction of 36%, uh, uh, the reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions is envisaged uh, by the year 2030, uh, which is lower than fit for 55 obviously but uh, and the uh, long-term climate strategy of Slovenia uh, expects the reduction between 55 and 66 percent uh, up to 2040 and for the for the 2050 uh, reaching climate neutrality uh, what does it mean for uh, industrial sector uh, in we have uh, decreased the greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 32 percent uh, in 2018. This is the data uh, 18, the data for 2018 in relation to 2005. Uh, the goal for the the goal, the indicative goal for the uh, industrial sector for the year 2040 is reduction between 60 percent and 70 percent and uh, objective for the year 2050 is the reduction of greenhouse gases between 80 and uh, uh, and uh, 78 uh, 87 uh, percent uh, we have built uh, to tackle this problem and to prepare the projections of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, we have built several models uh, in the scope of Life Climate Path 2050 project. Uh, Gaspar already mentioned uh, the, the model for households. Um, I was involved in the development of the industrial model. Uh, you can see a schematic overview of the uh, model for industry. It's a bottom-up uh, bottom model. Uh, techno technology uh, technology oriented uh, which means that we describe uh, various uh, sectoral technologies uh, and build stack them uh, build them up uh, from the bottom up uh, to represent the, the energy demand in this sector the leading parameter uh, for this sector is uh, physical production index of phys physical production and in some cases value added. Uh, we have interlinked the, the model also with the microeconomic model uh, for certain technologies uh, and uh, the results were also uh, used as inputs in the macroeconomy model uh, uh, providing assessments and impacts uh, in, uh, on uh, national uh, macroeconomic aggregates. Uh, as I said before, uh, the leading parameter uh, of the industrial model is economic activity uh, and there are two leading parameters actually economic activity and index of physical production. Uh, for uh, highlighted, uh, for industrial branches highlighted on this slide, uh, we have used index of physical production uh, which means that uh, uh, production in uh, kilotons in physical uh, production unit. Uh, this was done for manufacture of paper and paper products, uh, manufacture of uh, non-metallic mineral products, uh, namely cement, uh, manufacture of basic metals uh, for steel and also for 
uh, aluminium production. Uh, that was done also for production of primary aluminium and also production of secondary aluminium. Um, for uh, residual residual or branches highlighted on, on uh, I don't know what's that, uh, it's rose uh, color, colored in, in uh, highlighted in, uh, in, in purple, yeah. Uh, uh, for those branches we used uh, value added as a leading parameter. Uh, when building uh, different scenarios for uh, decarbonization of in industrial sector, we had to combine existing measures uh, that are already uh, on in the market uh, or in the market uh, existing measures and technologies that are already on the market. Uh, and we have combined them with the certain technologies uh, and measures that have uh, an uncertain dynamics, uncertain future dynamics. Uh, if uh, I can uh, highlight some of those is the use of uh, synthesis gas, uh, the use of hydrogen and the introduction of CCS and CCU uh, technologies for the uh, late, uh, late uh, period of uh, the addressed time horizon. Uh, highlighting some of the existing measures, uh, Fossil fuels are replaced either by electricity uh, or by CO2 neutral, neutral fuels. Uh, utilization of excess heat is really important measure. Uh, introduction of CHP, uh, this was done for industries where there is a high need of heat, uh, namely paper, chemical and pharmaceutical uh, industries. Um, other system services like district heating demand response was also taken into account and the gradual increase of energy efficiency uh, was was uh, uh, addressed. Um, some measures regarding uh, resource efficiency have been also taken into account, uh, such as um, the use of waste materials and uh, product reuse, refurbished products and recycling. Um, the key assumptions or the key basis that we build our, our model upon uh, are, in, uh, are uh, highlighted here. Um, uh, these measures are related to uh, specific technologies in industrial sector uh, for electric arc furnaces, uh, measures such as uh, uh, oxy fuel, use and uh, oxygen in action uh, have been uh, taken into account, a reduction of specific consumption for thermal processes uh, was included in the model, uh, the use of uh, waste heat utilization, uh, load management, uh, all those measures contribute to the reduction of specific consumption for thermal processes. Um, energy efficient motors, motors were also introduced uh, to the uh, industrial sector uh, from 2040 on all of uh, all of uh, electric motors uh, were either uh, ee i uh, ie2 pl plus uh, variable speed drive or ie3 or ie4 uh, efficient with efficiencies uh, uh, related to those uh, standards um, for compressed air, we have uh, we have addressed uh, leakage reduction uh, and optimization of of, uh, of compressed air. Uh, industrial boilers, uh, the the replacement of boilers uh, was was uh, uh, introduced in industrial sector uh, in in relation to the foreseen uh, uh, technology penetration curves. Um, we have also uh, uh, planned or, or addressed uh, or tried to, uh, to uh, include the industrial CHPs. Uh, as already mentioned, um, waste heat utilization uh, is uh, an important measure, as I already said. Uh, this was uh, the potential was recognized 
that uh, between 10 and 25 uh, percent of uh, of excess heat of share of excess heat in the heat required is uh, was was uh, envisaged by 2050 for steel and glass sector uh, switch from gas to elec electricity was also introduced uh, namely 30% of potential was uh, was uh, um, included by 2040 and 100% by 2050 uh, the use of synthesis gas uh, is also uh, one of the important uh, important measures uh, from 2030 on. Uh, 10 of synthesis gas in the gases fuels uh, is uh, expected in 2030 and uh, graduate, gradually increasing by 2050 up to 100 percent. Uh, assuming a central distribution of synthesis gas produced uh, from from renewable energy sources, uh, either uh, a part uh, could be produced uh, at uh, at the location or at uh, in Slovenia, uh, and uh, a larger amount of uh, this synthesis gas uh, is expected to be produced outside. Um, if we go to the results, uh, the results show that. In uh, Slovenian industry, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions could be reduced uh, by 21% uh, in relation to two 2017, uh, by 2030, and by 81% uh, up to 2050. Um, the orange, uh, the orange part of the bar, represents uh, process emissions, uh, which are really hard to tackle uh, hard to tackle on the right hand side you can see the the uh, fuel structure uh, for uh, for the fuel structure in industrial sector uh, in 2017 which was the base year of our uh, used in our model uh, there are six percent uh, six six percent of solid fuels uh, natural gas represents the majority uh, the, the most important uh, fuel for for thermal processes um, wood biomass heat and the share of renewables is 11 percent uh, for the year 2030 nine percent of waste heat uh, utilization is uh, waste uh, waste heat uh, is uh, Waste heat represents 9% of the uh, energy uh, required for heating purposes, 10% uh, synthetic gas, synthesis gas, and uh, the share of renewables is 29%, uh, which already includes the, the use of waste heat. Uh, and for the 2050, the, the uh, share of waste heat in the energy required for heating purposes is uh, 13 percent uh, which amounts to the renew uh, share of renew renewables up to 40 40 percent if we look into uh, uh, results per energy intensive industry um, the uh, branch uh, manufacture manufacturing of paper and paper products uh, with NATSA code C17 uh, for this sector uh, the results show that uh, by 2030 uh, we can re we could reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 49 percent, uh, and by 2050 for uh, by uh, uh, 89 percent. Uh, this uh, industrial branch uh, represents 10 percent of all industrial emissions, uh, and uh, you can see the the. Uh, distribution of fuels per per base year and for 2030 and 2050 on the right um, again uh, important uh, energy carrier is natural gas uh, almost 20 percent of solid fuels which are being uh, phased out uh, by 2030 uh, replaced by uh, uh, by wooden biomass uh, and some uh, waste heat utilization. Um, 
this reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in this sector is achieved through energy efficiency measures, fuel shift, uh, renewable energy sources introduction and the use of excess heat and of course, uh, as already mentioned, synthesis gas. For uh, production or manufacturing of chemicals uh, and chemical products, uh, this, the uh, uh, results show that uh, in this sector uh, we can uh, decrease the greenhouse gas emissions by 6% up to 2030, mostly due to uh, the high share of uh, process emissions. Uh, this is uh, um, a problem that is uh, hard to tackle. Uh, and by 45% up to 2050. Again, on the right you can see the, the, uh, the structure of fuels. Uh, natural gas represents around thir one third of the uh, energy required for heating purposes. Uh, wood biomass also around uh, third, and heat uh, and heat thirty two percent. For two thousand and thirty, uh, seven percent represents waste heat. Uh, natural gas slightly increases, uh, and the share of renewables is forty seven percent. Uh, including uh, waste heat utilization. Uh, for 2050, uh, the synthetic gas uh, plays an important role. Uh, share of renewables is more than half, to 52%, uh, taking into account 11% of waste heat utilization. And there is also a, a, a significant amount of hydrogen uh, planned for this uh, 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 hydrogen used in this sector uh, up to 2050. The share of uh, industrial, uh, the share of emissions for this sector in the whole industry sector is 5%. Uh, the following to the sector that has the most uh, industrial emissions, uh, namely 35% of the whole uh, emissions in industry, uh, this is a branch uh, manufacturing of other non-metallic mineral products. Uh, the high share of industrial emissions is mostly due to the production of uh, cement that uh, falls under this sector. Uh, up to 2030, there's, uh, uh, the results show that the emissions could be low, uh, lowered by 9% and by, uh, uh, by uh, 60 uh, 67, 76% up to 2050. Um, the reduction is achieved through the introduction of biogenic waste in cement production, uh, transition of electricity uh, in heat treatment furnaces in glass works, uh, energy efficiency measures, fuel switch, and the use of excess heat and of course use of uh, synthesis gas and uh, for this sector, uh, namely for the, for the production of cement, uh, we have uh, uh, used or we have uh, um, envisaged the, the use of CCS and CCU, uh, namely 80% of process emissions in cement production uh, could be captured uh, with this technology uh, in 2040. Uh, the structure of fuels is shown on the right. Uh, you can see a significant amount uh, of uh, waste heat, 11% uh, in 2030 and 15% uh, in 2050. Um, and the introduction of CCS was, uh, was uh, introduced or was done uh, for, for capturing the process emissions in this uh, sector. Um, Steel, uh, manufacture of basic metals, uh, C24, 12% uh, by 2030, 85% uh, by 2050, um, and the share or the, the, the structure of fuels is presented on the right. Uh, natural gas, of course, uh, uh, plays a major role in this sector. Um, some solid fuels uh, were there in 2017. Uh, which are going to be phased out by 2030 and replaced by, uh, by uh, either uh, natural gas or uh, uh, yeah, mostly natural gas. 
and also uh, in this sector there's a uh, highest potential for the waste heat utilization uh, namely 14% uh, by 2030 and 24% by 2050 uh, the share of uh, emissions of this sector in the uh, industrial sector is 20% uh, as i already mentioned uh, one of important measures is also uh, switch to electricity from natural gas in uh, steel furnaces for heat treatment. Um, this is uh, followed by the, the uh, intensive use of secondary aluminium in, in aluminium production companies uh, and uh, energy efficiency and of course use of excess heat and uh, synthesis gas uh, after 2030. Uh, for other industries, uh, we have modeled uh, separately uh, energy intensive branches and uh, uh, other industries. And for this sector, which represents 30% uh, of uh, industrial emissions, the results show that, uh, we, uh, that uh, emissions can be lowered by 21% up to 2030 and by 95% uh, by 2050. The structure uh, of the fuels uh, is shown on the right. Um, again, uh, natural gas plays a major role. Uh, there's a high share of renewables in this sector, 70%. Um, waste heat introduction, uh, increase of renewables, increase of uh, waste uh, wood uh, biomass uh, in 2030 and uh, in 2050, 8% uh, uh, of waste heat utilization uh, uh, and significant increase of wood, uh, the use of wood biomass in this sector, uh, uh, resulting in 40% share of renewables in 2050, taking into account also waste heat. Uh, to conclude, um, what what are the necessary conditions for the transition to climate neutrality? Uh, awareness and competence uh, for for the transition. Uh, at Josef Stefan Institute, we have an educational program which takes uh, an important uh, part in, in this awareness and competen competence raising. It's called EUREM, uh, Program for Energy Efficiency, Ma uh, energy, efficiency energy Managers uh, for Industry. Uh, so I think that uh, in regards to raising awareness and competence, we have uh, been quite successful in that. Um, do we have a culture of cooperation, trust and acceptance? I think that we still have uh, some work to do. We are somehow in a loading phase in, in this area, uh, but uh, we are loading. So. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be. Uh, we have to work on that. Uh, uh, one of important uh, pillars or conditions is also the proactive role of the state, uh, providing opportunities for different act uh, actors, uh, and also uh, uh, providing a framework for uh, for cooperation between decision makers, R and D institutions, uh, industrial sector, and uh, energy companies and also utilities to combine all the important uh, stakeholders from this area. Uh, we, we see uh, this uh, 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 a role that uh, the the state has to uh, has to take, and of course uh, another important role that that uh, ministries and uh, the the government has is to uh, how to successfully. Uh, to su successfully um, use the available EU funds for recovery and just transition, uh, how to, to uh, steer and to facilitate the strategic investments for uh, fulfilling the, the or supporting the uh, greenhouse gas emission, uh, emissions decrease. Uh, what are the most important challenges? Uh, when modeling uh, the introduction of circular eco economy, uh, how to model 
resource efficiency, product design and sustainability, uh, how to evaluate the socio-economic effects, uh, how to model behavior, um, how to address uh, challenges in the economic and social paradigm, uh, as we already heard from uh, Ravi. Uh, it's uh, really an interlinked, uh, interdisciplinary area. Um, and uh, one important challenge is also how to, uh, how to evaluate the impact of uh, the, the scenarios that we have uh, developed on the future structure of the, uh, of the economy. Uh, how to, uh, what does it mean for future national vision of uh, economic development? Uh, do we have any, uh, uh, any strategies and policies and also uh, grounds and basis for such uh, for such evaluation. Um, another challenge is also that we are uh, working on it right now is the interlink uh, of the model results results with the geographical information system systems. Uh, some of that uh, Gaspar already mentioned, and uh, as Professor Duic highlighted, it's really uh, important uh, area. Uh, of research. Uh, just to conclude, uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, this year's Nobel Prize for Physics went to the groundbreaking contributions to, comp uh, to understanding complex systems uh, for physical modeling of climate and uh, global warming. Uh, so uh, it's one of the, the confirmations that we are working on a really, really uh, complex uh, field of work. Uh, and uh, we, we should uh, keep up the, the good work and uh, but the, the Nobel Prize was uh, was already delivered uh, and uh, so we are uh, working on uh, f working forward uh, to future challenges so that's all from my side if you have uh, any questions just uh, ask uh, thanks for your attention Thank you, Mateusz, for your presentation. Uh, we do have one question from the or comment from uh, Mr. Franco Nemats, and he's saying for the prognosis of future reductions you should use could be achieved instead of is achieved. In Slovenia, namely, there is no reasonable measure behind to make the potentials being realized. And I would somehow uh, enhance this question. How much of the strategy goals which we have in, in, in the documents are somehow in, in, in a way also in, in the realization path of how much of these strategic goals are really in the implementation phase? Well, uh, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, we have uh, two major strategic documents that are, uh, that are uh, somehow uh, paving the way for, uh, for cli uh, climate neutrality. One is National Energy and Climate Path a Plan, and the other one is Long-Term uh, Climate Strategy. And in regards to the uh, implementation of the National Energy and Climate Plan, uh, there are uh, some measures foreseen uh, in this document which are quite ambitious. ambitious uh, and uh, we are we, we will have to monitor uh, and report uh, on the on the uh, implementation of these measures soon uh, but i will stay politically uh, <laughs> correct and say that uh, we are uh, working on that uh, but uh, hopefully the the uh, the intensity of, of this uh, work on that will, will have to increase if we would like to, to tackle the challenges that we, we have set in the NACP. And also uh, more ambition, ambitious goals are uh, in front of us with this uh, Fit for 55 uh, package. So uh, yeah, uh, as I said, <laughs> I would stay politically correct. Uh, we are the, the things are moving forward, but not at uh, a pace that we we all hoped for. Uh, there is another question from Mr. Gnezda. Are there any known qualification quantification of the savings reduction potentials stemming from the challenges in the slide number one? 
can you maybe refer to that slide? Uh, those challenges are very neglected today in mainstream industry decarbonation debates. Okay, uh, I, my uh, slide, the first slide starts with, <laughs> with number three, uh, but we have also, a, uh, I have to say that uh, when uh, in the scope of Life Climate uh, Path 2050, we have developed uh, uh, various, uh, a few different scenarios of uh, different I intensities of, of uh, measures uh, and paths uh, for reduction of greenhouse gases. Uh, one of them was also a scenario which is uh, called uh, scenario with existing measures. Uh, and scenario without measures. So these savings were evaluated uh, with uh, scenario-based comparison. Uh, uh, it's, it's actually slide one challenges where you have the... the ah, okay, sorry. Slide one challenges. <coughs> this is objectives. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah we one. have... Um, introduced uh, some uh, circular economy measures uh, mostly through uh, recycling in reduction of the the physical product uh, uh, which is a leading parameter for our model uh, and uh, we have also uh, made some studies on energy poverty uh, which are available uh, uh, which were reported under the life climate path 2050 project uh, and we have uh, connected uh, the the risk law model, which is uh, our core model for for uh, preparing uh, of the projections, with the macroeconomic model, uh, s uh, highlighting some of the impacts on the national economy, uh, on the uh, taxes, and uh, so on. So some steps have been made in 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 this direction. Uh, but uh, still uh, a lot of research has to be done in this field. So this is because I've uh, inserted these topics under the challenges uh, section. But uh, yeah, we, we have done some steps in that direction. Okay, thank you. We, we'll have the opportunity to discuss this also in the round table. I guess this is the first topic that we would like to discuss there, which innovative approaches uh, can we apply in the modeling for future of future scenarios. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Mateusz again for his presentation and I would like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Mr. Gregor Goricar is the Head of Relations with the EU Institutions at ELES, Slovenian Electricity Transmission System Operator. Uh, he is an electrical engineer and is coordinating cross-sector integration activities for transmission operator between electricity, district heating and cooling system. And uh, he will have the presentation with the title Role of the Integration of Sectors from the Perspective of TSO. Okay, you will show it? Yes. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, good day to everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, uh, before I start, I would just like to, to, to brief you with the latest news regarding the, 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 the happening about the prices of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the gas, of the electricity, and uh, few fossil fuels derivatives, uh, which, uh, of course, impacted on Europe in last days. So, uh, regarding to that, um, the European Union, uh, is announcing that they will take the measures in some way of speaking that they will uh, try to regulate these prices and um, we at ELS are afraid that this will impact uh, on the budget regarding for the green transition and we foreseen it one or two years ago that these scenarios that now are happening uh, will actually happen but we 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 thought that it will happen a lot uh, further in the future than actually is happening now uh, so what i would like to present you before those events was actually a teaser 
meant to be a teaser what, what the uh, electricity transmission system operator like ALS um, is dealing with because our core business is of course, of course uh, a safe and reliable operation of the electricity energy system of, of Slovenia. We are of course 100% government owned company. Uh, so, and, and this event, why I'm telling you, actually uh, emphasize and uh, give us the very important signal that we identified this, this, these events that are occurring now. And why this was the reason and is the reason uh, for Slovenia to strengthen the lines uh, regarding the innovative approaches uh, and to find the solution to be as much as possible energy import independent in the future because the future regarding the penetration of renewable energy sources is uncertain. The latest events in England uh, regarding the wind power and, uh, and, uh, and the measures of the uh, UK system operator that uh, cost nearly 100 million pounds to establish secure operation for one week uh, when they actually um, started coal fired power plants to save their system and to prevent that the UK would be in the dark. So those are um, sadly uh, very realistic and future scenarios for Europe and, of course, for the Slovenia. Uh, regarding the cross-sector integration, uh, LS is uh, a very important member of the ENSOE uh, organization, which is actually the uh, union of the whole, all transmission system operators in Europe. So uh, bear in mind that uh, Slovenia is actually interconnected with a um, uh, uh, wide net of the electricity energy system. Uh, in 2020, when we started with that, actually everyone was speaking about the power to X. So uh, how can we uh, converge um, the energy source uh, for example, from the sun or, or, or uh, from the hydro into the, let's say, electricity and maybe then, of course, converge it back if needed. And um, back in time, ILA started uh, to uh, look on these uh, different sectors as a possible way to integrate it uh, on the EU level, so with our, in our partners, uh, my my director, Mr. Rudolf Salobir is um, vice president of the research and development center, uh, department of the INSOE, and therefore those activities actually started. So, <clears throat> while I am speaking about this, that in the past we were oriented of course in 2050 and the systems are foreseen to be integrated so we are speaking about let's say one system of the integrated systems on the EU level regarded, regarding the uh, electricity system uh, the, the, the TSO point of view of the future energy systems. Uh, we are dealing with, with three sectors, uh, so mobility, uh, clean gases, and uh, of course the heating and cooling. In, in the uh, in late, I will of course um, uh, put a little more time uh, about, um, about the heating. This is the, the part I'm working on. Uh, my colleagues uh, are working on other two sectors regarding the e-mobility, LS has established the concept E8, uh, which is actually dedicated uh, for smart private 
charging infrastructures. We have established partnerships with the Slovenian companies like DARS and, and uh, Telecom, which is um, a um, post company. Uh, so the point is that, of course, we would like to charge private electric vehicles slowly uh, and during the night and, of course, use them as aggregated, let's say, uh, energy storage, so uh, uh, a big batteries to help, of course, to the electricity system. Other second one is called... Uh, so the so it's called the 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 concept is called called pentlia and it's meant uh, into the development of the electric transport system so um we are modeling and of course with other partners um uh, we are collaborating on several eu research projects how to establish uh the the right charging infrastructure for the um heavy duty electric vehicles in the future whose charging stations of course will be connected directly on the on the TSO system not into the DSO uh, voltage level of course uh, clean gas interests of LS we are searching uh, and researching how we can gain flexibility for the electricity system from electrolysis, uh, how we can storage the uh, hydrogen and uh, synthetic methane, and then of course uh, gain the seasonal storage of the energy, uh, how we can gain the resilience for the electricity system from those uh, innovations and, and technologies and how we can, of course, tackle the congestion management mainly on the distribution um, uh, voltage level, of course, regarding the congestion. Uh, regarding the clean gas, uh, the activities actually are, uh, are, are developing um, a little slow. Uh, the first activities was actually uh, are ongoing with the Ministry of Defense uh, right here on the right side down you see the possible location of the net of the of the of the uh, charging stations of the Slovenian army uh, and of course this net of the potential charging stations hydrogen star um, charging stations uh, of course are there are they will be connected of course in the European uh, net of charging stations so what I would like to say that regarding the gas we are um, at, the, at, at the right beginning of the of the whole story okay so now we are coming to 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 my point of um, work and the uh, uh, partners from from uh, outside of the company we are collaborating with the Slovenian institutions and um, municipalities and um, utility companies uh, dealing and uh, handling the district heating systems in Slovenia and of course with the partners abroad from different research institutions and um, organizations like Euroheat and Power, Bioenergy Europe, and others. So this would be the continuous um, red thread of my presentation. What I would like to say, when we were, of course, um, starting this journey of the sector integration between energy system, electricity energy systems and heating systems, so district heating system systems. That, of course, the use of energy sources for heating current situation in Slovenia, it is, of course, the rule of the thumb, presents 80% of the energy for households. Um, here you can see the um, 
roughly estimation how those energy how this energy demand for heating in 12 um, 218 uh, for Slovenian house households in gigawatt hours uh, is distributed what is uh, seen is of course that a lot of wood is used already today but sadly this is a big problem regarding the air quality which will of course um, heat us in the future because the clean air package which is already written on the EU level haven't reached us yet and of course uh, the other aspect which is of course concerning us and which is of course the, 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 the biggest driver and motivation is actually, actually electricity in the future that will be needed for the heating according to the uh, strategy document national energy and climate plan it is foreseen that by the 2030 for 0 0.9 gigawatt of the heat pumps will be installed in the electricity distribution systems just for the for the feeling um, today peak uh, power demand is 2.5 gigawatts uh, among those 2.5 gigawatts half gigawatt is already imported energy electricity so the increase for 0 0.9 and we must then, of course, uh, add 0 0.4 gigawatts of, of power that will be uh, expanded uh, according that, of course, this will be needed for the uh, charging station for, for e-mobility. So we are speaking about 1.3 gigawatt of additional power that will be needed. I am deliberately speaking about the power, not energy, because this is the, the biggest mistake of, I hear, because the, to dimension the system, you need to look at the highest, um, the peak demand of the power, not, not, not the, the energy. So, in one sentence, Promotion of the heat pumps is great, but what about the price of the electricity in the future? And while we were starting about this, the price of the electricity was less than 50 euros per megawatt hour. Today, the price of the electricity is over 100 euros, and we are expecting the, that the, it is not a uh, final destination. Uh, no one know, knows where it will end, but um, the feelings are not in our favor, I'm afraid. So the technologies we, were, we, are, we are modeling and taking into account uh, regarding the uh, renewable energy sources for heating in Slovenia are three foreseen from our side, uh, biomass, wooden biomass, deep geothermal energy and of course uh, solar thermal uh, we have two use cases uh, defined one is uh, uh, present district heating systems we have in slovenia approximately 35 district heating system working or operational and uh, of course we are looking how to um, how to help them uh, to, to regain their, their use uh, on lack of economy scale, of course, because uh, gas was uh, cheaper, now it's a different story, uh, and so on and so on. And the other is the Greenfield pro pro projects. So we are speaking about the district heating system of the fourth and fifth generation. They are, of course, enablers to easy uh, uh, put the, the renewable energy sources uh, for heat into the system. So we are, I'm speaking about the rural areas of Slovenia, which are representing two thirds of the Slovenia approximately on the rule of the thumb. And this is of course uh, a different challenge to tackle. 
This slide is very important and of course it uh, presents our fear as the transmission system operator and uh, colleagues of mine who are of course dealing with this um, um, security and operation of the system, we are of course aware that you need the certain amount of, uh, how, let's say, loads, so the users in the system. And the price is of course dictating who will use what in the future, speaking also about the energy sources in the future regarding the heating. So the, the biggest question is what will be the prices of the, of the heat for the end users in the future in different scenarios uh, when they and if they will happen. So of course we are foreseeing it and our simulations so far are showing that this formation phase of course will, will of course uh, influence and shift the price up but in the in the after this exploitation phase of solutions implemented in the field that if the measure will be taken in right way uh, the prices of the heating for the households should decrease on the sustainable level and acceptable level level for the households so the energy poverty is that what we are afraid of might happen in the future if the scenarios like this, which we are witnessing today in the Europe, could happen if we will not do our job uh, optimally. In 2020, we were <coughs> thinking exactly this drawing actually was created. So we were of course thinking on the left side of this slide that we know the prices of the electricity heat and the, for the transport, so the energy, uh, energy sources that are producing actually the heat uh, uh, or driving or producing, uh, for example, transport or, or heat or electricity, we know. So the prices in the present are known uh, there are, of course, methods how we can predict the future prices of the electricity and regarding the happening now, and you will see in the, in the, in the one slides in, in, in which will come later that we were actually, while we uh, made this um, multi-scenario uh, uh, sensitive analysis, we were quite good so the 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 on the other side from the prices uh, in 2020 we could in some in some scope predict the prices in the future for our modeling uh, regarding cross-sector digital twins we are building with our colleagues and on the other side of course we are looking the demand in the future uh, and generation. So what will be the mix? And we, we think that the mix of the sources is the, is the right answer. So what is the optimal mix in, for Slovenia in 2050? Or let's say 2030, 2040, 2050. How much hydro, how much nuclear gas actually in 2050 we are speaking about the green gas, of course, and the synthetic methane. How much of the renewable energy sources like biomass, solar, wind, and geothermal, which is not here, will be in this mix in the future? What will be the storage technology? Mm, how much the con how much how how uh, w which which percentage of the uh, conversions uh, must be present in the energy system? and so on and so on. Those were the questions, those were the goals when we started with uh, brainstorming how to tackle our modeling. The purpose of the modeling was of course explore possible sustainable heating strategies in urban environments and 
highlight to highlight technical environment a direct and in indirect economic impact of heating technologies. Our model, this is of course very high, high level, uh, consists uh, from um, different scenarios. So we took energy costs, CO2 prices, building renovation levels, cost of infrastructure. Uh, we took uh, grid parameters, grid extensions, of course, we took um, var um, technology selection and performance. And on the other side, of course, we set KPIs that we are following. So cost for consumer, GAG emissions, air quality. And this is very important, regional economic impact. The case study I'm showing you is actually for the Toposhitsa. It's, an, it's in a... Uh, Savinsko Šaleška region in Slovenia. We took a uh, number of the buildings that are into that are um, coped with uh, existing district heating system of uh, municipality Komunalno podete Velenje. The yearly heat consumption is 4.226 gigawatt hours. The length. Uh, 16 kilometers thermal losses, generator capacity, solar collector field size, share of solar energy. So we actually modeled the sources and we modeled the district heating systems through sets of differential equations. We modeled whole system through the thermal losses and we took a different time steps of our simulations. We took 15 minutes, half hour, hour intervals. This is very important and main message of our findings regarding CHP biomass versus heat pump. We took electricity energy prices 50, 100, 150 and 200 euros per megawatt and then we took or calculated levelized cost of heat in euros per megawatt hour. We calculated added value in 1000 euros per gigawatt hour. We calculated earnings in 1000 euros per gigawatt hour. And we calculated, we took a method of uh, economic multiplicators, we took the methodology of input-output tables, um, an old Russian method. So we calculated how much jobs we can create on a local uh, GDP level if we, um, if we uh, implement the CHP technology which we, by the way, in Slovenia, we have the knowledge. So the companies that are building and capable of building the CHP BAT technology exists in Slovenia. And we study the possibility very carefully. So <clears throat> regarding these price scenarios, we get this interesting matrix. Of course, it's not Definitely, it's not accurate. But the relations between these uh, prices and the, especially uh, uh, regarding the uh, levelest cost of heat, added value, earnings, and jobs, things become very interesting for us. And we say to us, okay, this might be the the great um, way. So you see that heat pumps, when price of electricity arise actually are um, from the economical point of view are not doing okay and that we are of course when we do not amortize we, we do not achieve amortization of the technology we which we import actually we are paying for the electricity we are we are we are not um, we are not um, electricity uh, so the the, the point what i would like to say is that in the chp we are beside the, the heat we are also producing electricity and for the and of course in the future we we, are, we intend also to simulate the the technologies 
uh, and the, uh, in the, the technologies and um, solutions for uh, geothermal, of course, and for solar collectors and seasonal uh, heat storages in the same manner like this. So each gigawatt hour generated with biomass contributes 220,000 so 220, euros to GDP, increases profit by 63,000 euros and generates six, job, six jobs. This is, of course, very rough. Those are very rough calculations, but according to our tests and, 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 and investigations, this skeleton of the matrix uh, makes sense. Uh, we, we, of course, we also um, agree on bottom-up approach. So um, this is a um, very sketchy estimation of ALS, uh, how we see ALS in the future regarding the, uh, the, in the, in the Slovenian national space, because we are, of course, government-owned company. So the collaboration will be needed with the energy regulator and, of course, with government with different ministries for infrastructures, for environment, and so on. We, of course, will establish, and we are doing on it right now, regional projects in different regions in Slovenia. Uh, of course, we will include um, district heating retailers, development agency, academia, district system operators regarding electricity, um, and so on and so on. Here, of course, those pilot projects will took place. It's, of course, in Slovenia. And this is actually all from my side for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gregor, for your presentation. Uh, we have uh, two questions and one comment, and I would like uh, Ms. Martina Gratschner uh, for her question. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello also from my side. My name is Martina Gratschner. I'm coming from the Ministry of Infrastructure. Uh, so we are closely linked to LS. So thank you very much uh, for this exhaustive presentation. And I have a question about your uh, one slide. Uh, you said this is like your most important slide. Uh, just a second. Uh, most important slide. Um, when um, in which you picture the price effect during the time and you uh, anticipate can we you hear me yes is this one uh, uh, the, degree, the, the price effect the uh, rise and the decrease um, uh, the rise and the decrease uh, in uh, the phase of exploitation of yeah. the electricity so I was wondering, what is the time frame for the decrease? Because you, yes, this one, yes, this one, correctly. Uh, because you don't have any time frame. So uh, what uh, is the exploitation uh, phase timeline? So, uh, um, I mean, approximately, you probably have these um, calculations, right? Yeah, so, uh, yes, so regarding, of course, we must empirically prove it on the field sites in the, in the pilot projects, but uh, we are, we are, we are, we are, of course, speculating um, that this time period should be by the 2030. So, uh, if we start with pilot projects, let's say, first, probably in Sasha region, region, uh, in the next years, hopefully 2022, 2023, then the effects of this decrease should be achieved at the latest by 2030. But it is very hard to predict. So 
uh, it depends mainly on the uh, mainly on the um, how we will be able to establish we are calling it now um, a sustainable energy cycle if we are speaking about the of course biomass so if we will be able to uh, master the whole cycle so how how the how the on the proper way uh, according to the fit for 55 uh, 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 recommendation the the waste wooden mast should be treated uh, so the whole this supply chain uh, till the uh, till the let's say burning of this biomass and then to to the end so to the end user um, it all those um, all those factors are very important in this um, decreasing of the of the price so we are we are we are expecting we are speaking while we while the while the project while, while the pilot project starts at least at least at least between three and five years but these are rough estimations so actually this is the reason uh, why we uh, strongly try to, to 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 start with with pilot projects in real environments because there are so many uncertainties and uh, it's really it's really ha hard to, uh, to 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 be smart. Can can you maybe just clarify? Is this is the electricity network charges on 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 the slide? It says network no. charges. Network charges um, for the heat. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we we have one comment from uh, Mr. Franco Nemats. Uh, he said that the solar thermal heating is not anymore the option for Slovenia, not for water or space heating. The technology and economy breakthrough achieved in the photovoltaic sector puts the solar thermal in the history. It's much better and economical to cover the building's roofs with PV, use heat pumps and battery storages and sell all the excess of the electricity to the electricity grid. Okay, um, okay. Uh, this will be my personal opinion. This is a typical green populistic fact because on the on the on the TSO side, uh, together with my uh, CEO, Mr. Merwar, uh, those calculations were of course made. So just to just to have the picture on the system level. So. Um, uh, we must, we must, of course there is no problem if anyone have PVs and all, every household uh, go off the grid, it's no problem. But this is not the way, because the grid is needed. And on the system, in, in, and in the system level, the technologies of the battery storage are way not mature, mature yet. By some predictions in 2035 2040 maybe just for 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 the illustration ls paid and made the made the contract with engine company for 50 megawatts of battery storage for secondary reserve and it costs 20 million euros if we would like to replace tesh which is uh, coal thermal plant and uh, nuclear power plant with the with the battery storage and have the photovoltaics so mix of household photovoltaics and big photovoltaic system we are speaking about 6.2 gigawatts of battery storage that is needed and if you then calculated that one megawatt costs today between one and two million euros, we are, we are speaking about 6.5 billion euros just in investments in the battery storages. And the same story regarding the, econom the econom economics goes on the, of course, slightly lower level, of course, on the Tesla, Powerwall batteries, and so on, and so on. And the regarding 
the, 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 the solar collectors and the seasonal storage tanks, we are, we are in deep conversation with Plan Energy Company in Denmark and the pit storage technologies and, and other technologies for storing seasonal heat are, we, we can count on them. And we strongly believe that this, what I'm speaking, the mix, right mix of and combinations of this technology would be, uh, would be probably would be the solution. So. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Merche. Yes, uh, thank you. I really appreciate your integrated approach which you presented. Also that you recognize the role of high efficient use of wood biomass for Slovenia, especially in co-generation, but as well in the efficient household uh, heating devices. Perhaps I just missed uh, the role of, you mentioned, uh, you, you, I think you presented very interesting uh, mixture of um, renewable fuels or renewable sources geothermal, deep geothermal, but most probably there's also quite important potential for shallow geothermal energy, which is much more somehow uh, easy to be implemented in, in larger buildings and all over the Slovenia and as well, it has much, much better uh, influence on the electrical grid due to very higher efficiency and higher efficiency also at the, at the lowest temperature when the grid will be uh, in the peaks. No? So most probably just this remark and your comments, please. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, a short comment on yes, it. I totally agree with you, and thank you for the fulfillment. Uh, uh, I have a question from Mr. Bancic. Do you have any estimates of the impact of sector coupling on electricity network charges? We haven't there. We, we are not there yet. Uh, together with our colleagues uh, on into the infrastructure planning division in the ELS, we are we have this in pipeline in in 2022. So. Uh, but definitely, it, w I can say that uh, there are estimations and activities that are ongoing now uh, is that this is the optimal uh, way. Uh, so the, the cross-sector integration on the system level will give the, the optimal economic answer for the future of the energy systems. This is for sure. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gorica, for your presentation and your answers. Uh, by this, I will be concluding uh, this session. Uh, I would like to invite uh, all of you to the round table uh, with the title, How Can New Challenges Be Addressed Through New Modeling Approaches and Analysis? We will start at 2 o'clock, uh, now we'll have a uh, lunch break. And uh, during this lunch break, I would like to invite all of the uh, participants online to put your name and your uh, information to the map of the, uh, of the conference uh, for the future networking. And uh, I would also like to invite you all, if you have any questions, uh, to use the chat section and uh, write us an, uh, a question or a comment uh, that you might have. Again, uh, we'll be uh, joining at 2 o'clock for the roundtable, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the participants uh, and all of the presenters uh, for this morning session. Thank you very much, and we'll be back at 2 o'clock.
Uh, dear participants to the conference, uh, let us start with the round table. How can new challenges be addressed through no mo new modeling approaches and analysis? We will have four members of the round table. Dr. Andrea Herbst from Fraunhofer Institute for System and Innovation Research. She is a competent center in energy technology uh, head and energy systems. And she is the senior researcher uh, in the field of uh, decarbonization of energy intensive industries, assessment of the circular economy for decarbonization, and scenarios of industrial energy demand and CO2 emissions. Uh, the next uh, participant is Professor Neven Duic, uh, whom we have heard uh, this morning, and Mr. Goričar from Transmission System Operator of Slovenia, ELES, and Mr. Stane Mrše, the Head of Energy Efficiency Center of the Jozef Stefan Institute. Uh, before we start with the roundtable, I would like to uh, invite you to participate in our Mentimeter. I will uh, start with the, uh, with, with the questions. Uh, you can get the information how to uh, connect to the Mentimeter uh, through link on the right hand uh, of your screen in the chat section, or you can enter by joining the dot www.menti.com and you enter the code 653638. And uh, let me start with first question. The first question is which are key challenges not properly addressed with the existing models? You can select up to two uh, words or two expressions uh, to participate in the in the poll you can either join by clicking to the link at the chat section or by going to menti.com with code We have the words like sufficiency, sector coupling, circularity, sector integration, renewable energy sectors, behavior, transport, storage. So which are the key challenges not properly addressed with the existing models? Air quality also and air pollution, one of the key challenges I'm inviting again uh, those in the in the hall. You can join us by uh, using your smartphones. The others you can join us through menti.com using the code or by clicking to the link in the chat section. So, which are the key challenges not properly addressed with the existing models? We mentioned before sector coupling, sector integration. We also managed to um, uh, discuss today the circularity, circular, in circular industry, air pollution, material efficiency, management issues. Okay, let's go to another question. And I would like you to select <coughs> multiple choices. How do you address uncertainties in these protect uh, projections? So how we do, do address the uncertainties? And we've seen that there are many uncertainties uh, from the energy prices to the uh, expectations what will actually uh, happen in 2050. We have uh, six selections, multiple scenarios approach, input data uncertainty, probabilistic simulation, mixed approach, multiple iteration approach, or any other Apparently, many of the approaches is multiple scenarios approach. We've seen in the presentations yesterday and today that uh, most of the uh, most of the speakers actually presented uh, how they approach to the long-term strategy by providing several examples, several 
scenarios and based on this uh, the decision has been made which scenario to uh, to use for the future so most of the answers have been selected to multiple scenarios approach some to mixed approach and we don't have any selections for multiple iterations approach or probabilistic simulation approach let us wait for another uh, 15 seconds and then we'll start with the rounds table I think I thank all of the participants to join us with the with the Mentimeter, and now we are uh, we have some uh, grounds also to discuss this during the round table. As I mentioned, we have invited four experts to the round table: uh, Miss Andrea Herbs from Fraunhofer Institute for Systems and Innovation Research, EC, Professor. Neven Duic from University of Zagreb, Mr. Gregor Guricer from ELES, and Mr. Stane Marche from Energy Efficiency Center. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity to <coughs> welcome Ms. Uh, Andrea Herbst from Fraunhofer Institute and maybe uh, give you uh, the first question. Uh, we have been discussing uh, the strategies and models uh, in the last two days. And maybe from your point of view, can you maybe describe a little bit on how Germany is approaching to the long-term strategies and models in terms of uh, climate change and uh, energy transition to low carbon economy? Yeah, thank you very much for, for your invitation to this uh, very interesting conference so, and also very interesting contributions today. Um, I think, uh, of course, uh, I cannot speak for Germany overall, but at least I can speak for our institute and we see really that the decarbonization poses a major challenge, not only in the long term, but also very challenging in the short to medium term. And, and at our institute, I think we, we address these challenges with a very interdisciplinary approach. And I think that's, that's proven rather successful in the recent past that we combine our extensive modeling knowledge. So we have a, a vast uh, group of models we use at our institutes from bottom up sectoral models to uh, top down macroeconomic models, integrated models together with the, with the knowledge of our social scientists, but also our foresight experts here at the institute. And this together provides a very um, robust or, or robust environment to make um, um, policy advice or scenarios on, on future developments. I think what we see is that in all sectors we have still major challenges and my personal focus is on the industrial sector and there we really see that the time frame up to 2030 is, is of crucial importance because we have to scale up energy intensive new process technologies which are not yet market ready. So we also see that there is a difference from this very long term perspective we were looking at, at in the past to now having to combine our long-term scenarios with short-term developments. And I think this is also a, a very big challenge in, in our modeling approach. And I think the, the third part, what we find rather important now is that we see that the, the traditional energy system modeling reaches its limits. And now we need to think outside of the box because we have now have different kind of research questions, which are also very strongly related to different agents, actors and stakeholders. So we cannot detach us uh, anymore from the, from the people and actors affected. So here the engagement and the interaction with the relevant actors is, is very important. And we see this will, is also integrated more and more in our modeling projects and approaches. And maybe the final point is that we, of course, need hybrid modeling approaches to, to address these challenges. And this is nothing new. So we all did it before and saw how, how difficult hybrid modeling approaches is using a variety of different 
are models, but we still think this is the way forward to overcome the weaknesses of our different types of models and use the strength of each modeling approach. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh... I have prepared a couple of uh, topics that uh, we would like to discuss uh, at this round table and these topics will be uh, shown in the in the chat section so uh, all participants who would like to uh, to participate also in the in the discussion and also at the at the round table uh, please do check uh, the uh, the section in 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 the chat section and I would like to start with uh, uh, the question to all four of the participants of the round table, and this is which innovative approaches have you applied in recent modeling of future scenarios or various sectors? What cross-cutting technologies have been used, uh, circular economy models and stuff like that? So I would like maybe first ask Professor Duic, uh, since you are also presenting your results of the modeling uh, processes, uh, so what innovative approaches have you been using and what innovative approaches maybe you still have to include in the future scenarios? Well, I, um, I touched the subject um, uh, during the lecture. Uh, we are very much working on the sector coupling, uh, which is the most difficult uh, part in uh, modeling. Uh, recently, we have uh, prepared... Uh, um, a way how to uh, model sector coupling uh, and high penetration of variable renewables in uh, EMS uh, with uh, 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 a way of uh, calculating uh, 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 load curves for renewables depending on different flexibility options. Uh, so this uh, this has uh, now been published, I think, also, um, and uh, we find that uh, very innovative because no EMS was uh, able to do that. But we are also uh, 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 trying to uh, uh, always model any new possible idea of coupling. Uh, we uh, still don't know what will uh, happen with. Uh, synthetic fuels, how they will come out, uh, and how many uh, of the uh, circular uh, connections between different sectors will happen. So uh, these things are uh, uh, under discussion always. Uh, but of course, uh, one has to limit the model to a reasonable amount of technology. So uh, uh, the, there is still place for uh, improving that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marche. Uh, we have heard uh, many presentations in the last two days about Slovenian approach to the uh, modeling. And maybe from your side, uh, what are the the innovative approaches which have been used maybe from the beginning? Because we know that the first models uh, are actually have been prepared in the late 90s, and now this is. Uh, 25 years after the first models, what has been improved in this time uh, and uh, maybe what are the new expectations, what new models and what new approaches will have to be used? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, yeah, we b we have started to build our models bottom up. So definitely, we are all all all, all from the beginning. We are building uh, from the individual data. Here is also one advantage of the Slovenia that it's a small country and it's easier to to collect data or e at least to collect data from the bigger uh, energy consumers or bigger branches. Or but always there are always challenges as well as here. But somehow, this was let's say. Our our advantage that we build up the model from the real life and uh, try to be as concrete as possible. I would say in this last few years, I think the key innovative approach which we integrated in our comprehensive uh, energy models framework is the use of geographical information systems. So that we, especially for planning our heat demand and heat supply, as it was demonstrated today in the presentation of uh, <coughs> Gaspar, uh, you can uh, you, you you could see that yeah uh, 
uh, that we try to get geographical information data and by that more accurately plan uh, the potential for district heating system supply in more densely populated area or the area with a higher energy consumption density. As well, we use this approach to to, co to link the industry with the district heating system for utilization of waste heat, which is ag again uh, geographically geographically based. Yeah, so um, this is, I think, something very important of, on the heat coupling with other sectors. So, but definitely we still we made some first attempts to, to better uh, anal analyze the, the, <coughs> the generation of renewables, especially the photovoltaic and potential of photovoltaic. But definitely we see here a lot of challenges for more accurate modeling of energy storage, uh, linking of sectors, as already Nevan mentioned. Yeah. So this is, I think, our next steps to be more accurate in uh, some uh, heat load curves on the hourly level so this is uh, and some of uh, definitely and new new technologies which are coming to the to the market are always posing challenges to to, uh, to update our models uh, thank you uh, miss herbst uh, maybe the question for you you, you mentioned that uh, Frank Hofer was involved in uh, scenario preparation uh, for decades and uh, Maybe also from your perspective, what was what were the changes that these models went through in terms of quality, new approaches, uh, different sectors, and so on? Yeah, so I, I'm on, only there for one decade, so I can definitely speak mm -hmm. of this decade. And I think the change really, on the one hand side, it was a, a, like a contentious change. So from energy efficiency and modeling of energy efficiency measures, diffusion to, to now, which was a very important topic and, and vastly um, analyzed for the industry sector when I, I started my work to now more uncertain technologies, new processes, innovations, which are now a very important part of the decarbonization scenarios and the core of the model. And these, of course, are prone to higher uncertainties because the technologies are not on the market yet. So we are strongly dependent really nowadays, not so much on empirical data, but more on, on expert know-how interviews or company information to model these um, these changes or these transformations. So this is a large uncertainty, but it was also a very big uh, opportunity to get in contact more with the, the agents and stakeholders. And this really helped to improve the model. From a methodological point of view, I think um, one important part was, of course, as mentioned before, for the other models, the regional disaggregation. So this is something we did in the recent past, but of course is still not finished yet. So uh, we are currently working very uh, strongly on, on regional, regionalized industrial demand projections. And of course, there we have challenges. I think for the, for the energy intensive in industries, um, there, are, there is a very good databases on plant locations and the capacities and also processes used, but also for other industrial sectors, like for example, engineering, it's much more difficult to, to regional, uh, regionalize the, the industrial demand. This is one challenge. And what we also see uh, for the projections in the future in climate neutrality scenarios, of course, there is, there is not completely clear which industrial clusters or companies will remain until 2050. So this is really a challenge when, when modeling a transformation on a plant basis, more or less. So because this is a, a company decision, which does not only uh, depend on, on energy carrier prices, but also other factors. So we are working on this. And I think the the second challenge we are currently working on is really um, this transformation from this uh, very process process specific view on industrial energy demand to a more product related view because we need to integrate these aspects of circularity and sufficiency so the process approach which was very good in the recent in the in the past is not longer enough for the future so to uh, model circularity and sufficiency you really have to look at the whole value chain of industrial products and the end users and that's the challenge we're currently working on 
maybe additional question. You mentioned circularity and the circular economy to be included in in, in the models. Do you have maybe already some uh, recommendations also for other com- countries preparing this and how to include this in, in into the system? Do do we know what uh, actually means going from process to product related approach? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I can rec- recommend it, but what we do, and, and this is really, I think, also very data intensive and, and also resource in- intensive approach. What our approach is now to combine our bottom up energy demand modeling with uh, other disciplines. So we are looking at material flow models now and, and also um, input from LCA. So we see that this, this energy system modeling approach is no longer sufficient. We have to use these other disciplines, like for example, industrial ecology. And now um, we are working on, on material flows for the most important energy intensive products to be then hopefully in the position to really model the impacts of certain circularity measures. Uh, Mr. Guricher, you mentioned that uh, in, in the last years, uh, you had to change from presenting the, or using the models for the uh, modeling of uh, electricity consumption and uh, how to cope with the electricity supply. But now in the last years, you are experiencing this uh, combination with other sectors. And maybe can, can you describe maybe how this evolved, how this system actually evolved going from a typical transmission system operator company to a company who needs also to take into account other sectors and uh, quite different approaches to consumption of electricity. Yes, thank you. So um, basically, the, 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 a lot of uh, techniques and, and, and methods, uh, as were described uh, with my predecessors, uh, we are using also. Um, we actually outsourced um, experts who uh, made the, their PhD thesis from ETH Zürich and uh, their uh, expert uh, their expertise is actually in energy multi energy hub modeling on actual uh, city uh, burn and the approach is similar as Mr. Merche described. Uh, so what we are doing is that we are actually collect, so we started modeling from the scratch. So we are bottom up building. So we are gaining the data from district heating companies, from calorimeters, uh, from the households, where are of course in place. We are using machine learning methods to predict um, uh, and to, to build the models where those data uh, real measure data isn't available. We are using, of course, um, uh, weather forecasts and so on and so on. So everything, all, all data which are, of course, available. We are also using GIS system. Uh, and um, what are uh, also to add is, um, so uh, we are also taking in account, into account local energy concepts of the of the certain municipalities. So this, um, of course, we are taking into account also uh, spatial uh, uh, integration barriers. So uh, from from the other side, if we would like something to change and integrate, of course, you can uh, tackle with this problem. So. Uh, and also um, from the economical point of view and circular econo- economy, we are using these input output tables so that we are, of course, calculating the impact of the, on the local GDP uh, uh, while we integrate uh, a co- combination of those technology I described before. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Herbst and uh, Professor Duic, uh, You've been vo- both involved uh, w- with modeling also on a large scale, I mean the European scale. Uh, what, what is the difference when you prepare a, or when you run models uh, which will somehow be on an international level and will discuss the scenarios uh, which would include several countries and on the other hand when you provide this for one single country or when you provide this even for one single sector? within a, a scenario. Ms. Herbst, uh, first, please. Yeah, thank you for this question. I think um, what we are doing is that we uh, have model uh, national results and then add them up on EU level, for example. And of course, 
when you uh, work on EU level, then of course you have a vast amount of data you need for all the different countries. So this is the first challenge. And of course, what we see when we have EU projects, then the level of detail is less than when you work on a national project. So for example, in the German national projects, we can go much more into details because we do not have these country differences. And uh, of in addition, we have more specific knowledge because we have a very direct uh, link to the different um, stakeholders and technologies and more sector knowledge, for example, for Germany. Then we have, for example, for countries like, I don't know, uh, um, smaller countries there, we often have not so much data available as we need. I think that's the challenge. But of course, when communicating and discussing, a lot of information gets lost when you only look at on, on EU level and not on national level. Uh, Professor Duic, uh, maybe the question just a little turned around to you. You are presenting the model, the results of a model for the Southeast Europe. So how this goes in combination with the models that have been uh, also used to uh, provide uh, this type of results uh, on a European level and how this fits together. Does it fit together or we see some differences between the results of different modeling approaches? Well, the, the crucial question is, what is your question? I don't, don't mean your question, but what do you want to find out from modeling? Uh, if you want to find out uh, how well uh, you have to integrate sectors in order to integrate uh, renewables, uh, it is perfectly okay to calculate um, the whole region uh, as one uh, system. Uh, because you can always say, well, we will uh, build as much as necessary of the grid connections uh, to have uh, the balance system in one zone. Uh, but if you want to calculate uh, what will be the interplay uh, between different zones, between different political strategies, energy strategies, uh, then you have to calculate uh, each zone separate. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the results will be different, but um, uh, we have to understand that energy planning is not uh, predicting future. We are not predicting future. We are just calculating scenarios. So uh, the scenario uh, will give a result depending on the question you ask and how do you build uh, the model so that you can ask the question. Uh, but... Uh, 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 the results will fit in if you uh, use the same uh, predictions, but well, there are some crucial questions. If you're modeling on a small country, everything is much more complicated. Uh, because we are uh, now having interconnected European system and we are trading this electricity across the borders, uh, if you uh, look at European continental system as a one system uh, that has a particular uh, specificities in various zones, uh, then it's much easier to integrate variable renewables. But often uh, experts uh, try to calculate uh, a single country uh, with uh, a false idea that uh, everything has to be done as an island. Uh, then you get a completely different set of answers. Of course, you have to uh, take care of security of energy supply in case of something happens. So you need to have local resources, uh, but trying to balance the system on a national level in every single uh, hour or a minute uh, will uh, produce very different results. So uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, correctly answer your question, you have to follow realistic assumptions. And uh, I would now uh, ask uh, Mr. Goricar, uh, you are now in position that uh, you, you need to look at Slovenian transmission system as one island, but on the other hand, you are connected and you have this good connection to the uh, NSOE and to, to the countries which are neighboring Slovenia. So how do you approach to this uh, to this uh, two, two side approaches. So one is really internal approach and the other one is international approach and connection to the system. 
Yes, thank you for for the question. Uh, so regarding, so we have to clarify two things. So one is TSO aspect uh, on national level, and of course on the into the interconnection of NSOE. And second approach, which is much more difficult in, and unclear, in DSO level, which is not into the domain of LS, but of five distribution companies in Slovenia. So to answering the f the the first thing. Uh, what is uh, so? What is considering ALS and uh, transmission level? We are able and capable and safe uh, to import the 100% electricity from other countries. So the transmission system is is ready and is prepared for the integration of the renewables. What is uh, what is uh, concerning the distribution level? So th there is a lot of things to be done. One is observability problem, uh, interoperability of the data, uh, the, the metering data, so, so the problem of assessing the, uh, the low voltage uh, metering data from household meters, and so on and so on. So, of course, I will agree with, 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 with my predecessor that the important thing is that we must answer to ourselves what we would like to model and um, we while uh, we are um, uh, modeling on the um, municipality levels regarding the uh, sector integration between heating and electricity uh, in the future we we are establishing the relations with uh, distribution companies that will gain us the access to the metering data and then we will of course model how the electricity system on the distribution level, ca level can gain the flexibility from the heating system. So on the other side how can we control heat pumps for instance and how much of the electricity needed for heating can be postponed on the different sources of heat for example, biomass, geothermal, and solar, and so on and so on. Okay, can I maybe uh, add a question to that? Uh, in, in the scope of NSOA, so this is the, the uh, Association of uh, Transmission System Operators in Europe, do you also have your own predictions for the future? I mean, the uh, energy demand uh, and uh, connections between the systems for 2030, 40, 50 uh, yes, so NSOE is has a uh, 10 years uh, network development plans. So in the future, on the NSOE level, NSOE level, NSOE organization is a huge organization. And uh, regarding the research and dev development uh, department, for the 2050, they see the one system of integrated systems. So from the one perspective, uh, much better interoperability and um, collaboration among the all TSO system operators on the one side, and from the other side, sector coupling regarding the gas, uh, transport, and uh, electricity and heating and cooling systems. Uh, thank you. The next question I would address first to Mr. Marche, uh, the integration of and I would say energy sectors and also sectors coupled to, to the energy sector requires modeling uh, in uh, new time scales. Uh, there is minute versus uh, hourly level. We, we see a huge difference when we discuss one hour on a typical day or when we discuss dynamic model because of the new, uh, new approaches of the immobility and things like that. And the, the question is now how these systems evolve in terms of time scales in, term of, in terms of regional scales, uh, and how do you deal with this? Yeah, um, that is very a challenging uh, aspect you mentioned. Yeah, so I agree that definitely we should go here into some more details. Uh, although already now we, we model our energy electricity demand on the hourly basis uh, on a transmission system level, but in, ever, in any case for, uh, for more accurate assessment of uh, integration we should go, at, I think, at least to the hourly level. Or at least my uh, feeling is also that perhaps uh, we should address at least some specific aspects and to model them more accurately. 
uh, especially the uh, let's say the solar uh, energy generation this is something which we should more in detail uh, an analyze in Slovenia how it is spread around the country and how it spread also in the on the region because definitely as we just talked we should look into the regional level and to, to see what is the uh, contribution of these sources on the, on the regional level and what can we expect in the future but on the other hand i think we should also focus on which was also stressed the today morning on the most critical days which will be probably most challenging for the future more uh, as you already mentioned some cold winter days without renewables or without uh, some other sources so most probably we should somehow analyze the different situation and and try to build the models uh, on them and especially from the security of the supply definitely i think the the focus uh, should be on the providing energy in a critical situation so that we somehow estimate what could be critical situation for our country and what should we provide in such uh, circumstances but on the other hand build on the regional approaches uh, and try to to increase the cooperation and exchange with with the region and to optimize uh, the operation and supply uh, in the region but in any case the key challenge here is definitely a new challenge is how energy demand will 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 re respond and will be active um, in this new framework in these new price signals which are not yet known in detail but somehow we can see in which direction it goes and this is i think the most one of the key uncertainty how the energy demand will be uh, adopting or will be active and will will, <coughs> will respond to the situation and based on this is i think one huge uncertainty and one huge challenge how yeah, we can the demand response could be managed that as we already also heard today that uh, demand will uh, follow the supply and no? this is i think the key change in the uh, <coughs> Uh, philosophy and we should definitely adopt our models to that so without more detailed modeling on the hourly level or, or minute level at least for some technologies definitely we could not properly address these challenges in the future i guess no it, uh. Yeah. Uh, i would also like to invite uh, of course all participants to make your questions or your comments uh, to the conference uh, by raising your hand so we can uh, open the mic for you and uh, I, I would also uh, address this question to Professor Duic. Uh, you mentioned today there is a problem between some models where hourly modeling would be really challenging and you don't have sufficient data in order to have a good data. We know that uh, if the data is, uh, is bad at the beginning, then the result will be even worse at, at the end. So maybe your, uh, your comment on these uh, time scales and uh, regional aspects which you mentioned before? Well, the, the critical thing is to know what you want to calculate uh, because uh, time scales uh, depend very much on uh, the type of system you're calculating and what you what is your question. So uh, if you want to uh, have a system with significant share of variable renewables and you want to know what are the investments needed in various technologies uh, in order to have it function, uh, you absolutely need to have uh, uh, hourly level, uh, uh, so 8,760 hours. Um, of course, if you're calculating a response uh, uh, of ancillary services, you have to go to much shorter time. But one should not mix these two things together uh, because uh, it is impossible to answer uh, two questions, how much of the capacity we need and how much ancillary services you need uh, with the same calculation. That would be too, uh, too big. So uh, uh, if you are going to smaller periods of time, uh, then, of course, you can uh, see what happens in the worst case scenario of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a fast uh, uh, losing solar power. This is uh, uh, one of the complicated situations that one can have. Uh, but uh, many of uh, the energy planning models are based on... Uh, uh, typical days or worst case scenarios. 
And um, especially the worst case scenario will give you a completely wrong picture if you're trying to calculate uh, 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 systems with uh, high penetration of renewables. Why? Because in the worst case uh, day, uh, there will be no uh, wind and no solar. Uh, so you practically cannot calculate such a system based on the worst case. Of course, you need to have uh, backup, uh, but uh, you will get a completely wrong economic analysis because uh, in most of the days, which will not be the worst case situation, uh, most of the electricity will be supplied by uh, wind and solar. Uh, and if you uh, use worst, case, uh, worst day uh, as a, a typical day, uh, then you will have, uh, uh, as a result, much more uh, base load, which will actually not uh, be economical at all. So this is a completely wrong approach. Uh, of course, you have to, uh, in some way, uh, take care about the worst uh, uh, days. Uh, that's why typical day is not good, because if you do typical day, uh, then you will have uh, some uh, 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 average day, uh, which will not cover also the worst days. So uh, by using the full uh, time series, you're actually accounting uh, in the right way for all possible situations. Uh, a full time series will cover the worst case uh, scenario, uh, worst case day, but it will also give you the right economics uh, evaluation of the whole system, uh, which is crucial when you want to model uh, uh, systems with uh, high penetration of variable renewables. Uh, I would like to uh, point out uh, the different models that are approached uh, in, in the modeling community. Uh, what I have in mind is, uh, so far we are speaking more or less on the technology-driven models. So it's about energy system, it's about uh, hourly data, how we will uh, produce as much energy as needed for, for to cover the supply. What about the other uh, parts of this uh, modeling? For instance, the economy. We always see the problems how to model what will be the consumption from the uh, from the sectors which are somehow based on the development of the economy development of the uh, society as, as itself so how do you tackle this in in your modeling approaches i assume the question was for me yes yes okay you know so i think um that's what i mentioned in the beginning we we are only able to tackle this by using uh, different models together so via hybrid energy model systems and there we have these bottom up demand models which for the different sectors industry buildings transport and then we have the supply side models on on the on the generation and then we have the macroeconomic models uh, which look then at the either on European or German level on the on the uh, economic development and on the impacts of this energy transition on the on the future economy. And this alone to link is not enough. So we have when we want really to to assess the impacts, then we need iterative approaches. So uh, more than one scenario run, we have to calculate in loops. And then, of course, there are certain indicators which are fed into the macroeconomic models. And on the one hand side, of course, these are energy costs investments, but also um, information on changes in, in, in technological uh, in technologies used or in, in industrial structure, for example, which has then been provided for the macroeconomic models and integrated. And then these models, of course, feed back the information on how does this impact, for example, industrial production. But in the end, this is still not sufficient because when you want to look at circularity and, and societal innovations, then there is another dimension, which is then even more important to, to integrate because the, the, the society as an individual is also not integrated in these macroeconomic models. So I think there was still room for improvement. Can I maybe uh, just out of curio curio curiosity uh, ask you what what was the 
uh, expected energy prices and CO2 prices when you're designing your models. We know that at least uh, in Slovenia, uh, the prices we were using for our calculations were like for for gas 30, 35 euro per megawatt hour, and now we are experiencing these prices of 80 euro per megawatt hour. Electricity is at 150. Uh, CO2 uh, coupons uh, were expected to be around 35 euros, and now they are 60 euros. So how how, how does this uh, how does this uh, affect the the modeling uh, area, and how fast you have to adapt to that? Yeah, I think we are in a very lucky position with the bottom up sectoral models because there the energy carrier prices are a major input. So uh, depending on the scenario, we can assume uh, different developments. Of course, what we see, for example, in the industry sector is that, uh, especially, for example, in G steam generation, the price difference between, uh, for example, electricity and fossil energy carriers really makes the difference if these technologies, if these carbon neutral um, steam generation technologies come into the model sooner or later. Um, concerning CO2 neutral uh, technologies, we also see that these are with the electricity prices we see and expect uh, are not competitive in comparison to, to um, less uh, innovative technologies. So there we really have to, to make an exogenous diffusion of these technologies because in an economic scenario, they would not enter the market yet without additional instruments to support them. Like for example, um, CCFDs or, or uh, higher carbon prices, CO2 taxes. And um, from a macroeconomic perspective, of course, we also see that, that this um, calibration or on the past, of course, has some drawbacks due to the very, um, very strong changes we, we will see probably in the recent future. But, uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Duic, what is your, uh, uh, what is your comment to, to the current prices and how this is reflecting in the modeling approach? Well, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> again, impossible to uh, predict uh, a future. Uh, we can only work with assumptions, and if uh, those assumptions are uh, uh, given, uh, uh, you always have to take into account some uh, 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 some external uh, values, and prices are usually like that. Uh, so uh, generally, uh, price of electricity might be something that uh, you want to try to model. Uh, but for that, you have to have uh, uh, the model of uh, wholesale market and probably market coupling. Uh, but the price of uh, gas, uh, if you're only modeling uh, energy system, uh, uh, power system with heat system, you're probably not going to model. Um, and uh, we can see that this uh, gas prices have... Uh, uh, quite uh, political background, so modeling that is not really possible. Uh, but with uh, uh, such prices, it's uh, quite easy to, uh, uh, to to see the results in the model. Uh, the model will, of course, uh, result, if it's a long-term model, in more renewables. Uh, but the problem then is, are you calculating uh, the maximum capacity of the industry to build new renewables, uh, which we know is a main uh, barrier to uh, uh, moving very fast towards renewables. Uh, we have uh, uh, a recent history uh, around 10 gigawatt of wind per year in Europe, uh, and European Commission now wants 30 gigawatt per year. Uh, how many years we will need to reach that level. It, this cannot be done quickly. So uh, in the model, uh, which is not EM, but uh, only energy uh, system model, uh, you will, of course, uh, not uh, calculate uh, the limits on the industry. But if you're uh, working on an EM model, which means you want to calculate everything, including the industrial uh, capacities and uh, material 
uh, limitations, uh, then you will be able maybe to capture that. So again, the question is, what is your question? Uh, I do have a question from the audience and uh, also uh, for you, Professor Duish, for the first comment, uh, do you expect significant differences in electricity prices between seasons? We have discussed today uh, winter, a cold, dark winter day without the renewables and a sunny, warm summer day where there is no need for heat of, of buildings, but rather only process heat for industry and nothing more than that. Well, the, the, the main uh, price differential that we see in the long term is between, on one side, night and day, where electricity will be cheap because marginal electricity will be renewable. Uh, and the price will be uh, more or less uh, 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 decided by uh, uh, demand response technologies. Uh, on the other hand, morning and especially evening, the prices will be high uh, because marginal technologies will be uh, gas now, uh, biomass and hydrogen later or hydro. Uh, which means that uh, the prices in those parts of the day will be very high. Uh, regarding the seasonal differences, uh, we will probably be seeing uh, uh, such things, uh, but uh, uh, um, from the side of the wind, uh, it's relatively well uh, balanced with solar energy. So you have a lot more solar energy in the summer and more wind energy in the winter. Of course, in the case of uh, winter windless weeks, the prices will be very high uh, because all those backups will have to work uh, and the marginal uh, price will be high, uh, but these will not be very often. Uh, whatever uh, people are saying, the models are actually uh, showing that if you have a well-balanced continental level of uh, energy system, uh, we will not be seeing such situations uh, very often. Uh, Mr. Guricar, uh, the same question to you. Uh, among the transmission system operators, what is your impression on future prices in terms of daily prices, in terms of seasonal pricing? Uh, yes, um, I agree with uh, with Mr. Duic and uh, so uh, the most uh, uncertainties and fluctuations we see uh, on this seasonal uh, level, so in the winter times, uh, and uh, one aspect uh, wasn't emphasized is uh, energy storage on the system level. So this question hasn't been answered yet, or otherwise the technology are not matured yet. So we are really afraid on the Slovenian level what will happen when the our only coal power plant will be shut down in 2033. Uh, we, as I said before, um, LS and Slovenia can import 100% of the electricity from the European market. But what we will do when we, we, we don't have our, um, our, our, um, our source, so what we will do when some unexpected events in the on the EU level will occur occur for instance like 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 uh, events in England when when wind uh, with, with when um, the problems with wind occurred and if they uh, wouldn't have um, uh, coal power plants uh, UK will be in the dark so so we models are okay I agree with them as Mr. Duit said, but uh, as a system operator, we are asking what we will do when unexpected events will occur, and they will. And uh, regarding the prices, the prices will be high. We predicted the prices 100, 150 uh, a few years upfront, but we are now facing these prices. So. I'm afraid that the prices will be sky high. If, if I may uh, uh, add, yes, we have to get used to high prices sometimes, fully agree. Uh, on the other hand, uh, absolutely, we will need backup 
uh, for such situations. But uh, in normal operation of uh, systems, the backups will not be used. Uh, so you need a backup that will be cheap to build. Uh, the price of fuel doesn't matter, can be very expensive. Uh, this will be the most economical backup. If your backup is a baseload power plant, that will not be uh, very economical. Uh, Mr. Marche, uh, the question in, in the strategies you uh, somehow, and, and we saw this in presentations for Slovenia, we're expecting uh, that there will be sufficient synthetic gas available on the market in 2040, 2050. Uh, so how, how is this, what, what is actually to expect in reality or what needs to be done in order this to, to become true? Also for the countries like Slovenia, which is a small, can we expect that uh, each country will somehow be sufficient on these new uh, energy sources, low carbon energy sources? Uh, yes, thank you. This is definitely one of the challenge, which we are one of the uncertainty, which we definitely should look more into detail. Uh, we, in our scenarios, we uh, did not uh, specify um, from, yeah, as you mentioned, where will this uh, synthetic gas come from. Definitely, in our projections, we have, let's say, 10 gigawatts of photovoltaic in Slovenia, which is uh, extremely above our future demand so definitely we should somehow uh, e evacuate this energy either to the uh, to the regional member states or to somehow uh, transform it to the some synthetic fuels as we talk today so definitely there is a potential to transform this energy because definitely in our scenarios we have uh, excess of energy uh, uh, in the 2050, but definitely this is solar energy, no? So, yeah, uh, and there is a question whether we will have this uh, transformation in Slovenia or there will be uh, some of this energy will come from abroad. Definitely, I see the potential to have uh, some generation in Slovenia, especially li to link this generation with district heating system and to use the waste heat, which will be available in such transformation. So, but most probably not all uh, fuel will be provided from the local generation uh, it looks like but yeah this is one uncertainty which is very difficult to to respond now yeah so where will this synthetic or electrical fuels come from we will see you know this is also a question of the market which will definitely be established also in this uh, uh, this fuel area so we will see you know yeah this is something quite uh, a challenging question definitely mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Ms. Herbst, uh, the question to you. Uh, Germany was always known to be a technological leader in different energy technologies. And uh, is how can you comment on this, whether Germany is also looking into these uh, business opportunities of being a supplier to low-carbon energy sources, uh, supplier of the technology, and how can this be maybe included also in the macroeconomic uh, views in, in terms of energy modeling? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think Germany um, as a technology supplier will still, I think, try to focus on this role. We have companies like Linde who are working on solutions for the whole hydrogen uh, value chain, for example. So I think there is definitely um, the chance and also the challenge uh, to be uh, in, a, in a technology leadership position. I think the same holds true for the the uh, energy intensive industries, like for example, the steel industry, Salzgitter is working on, on hydrogen based steel production using uh, natural gas as a bridge technology. ThyssenKrupp just announced that they're using now more pig iron in their furnaces. Um, but of course, there are also other countries who are in investing and, and researching in new technologies, like for example, Sweden with the hybrid project on hydrogen-based steel production. But I think there is a chance in Germany. Um, of course, what is often mentioned in, in this context as well is, is still the danger of carbon leakage, for example, so that maybe this uh, leadership role will have some difficulties due to higher CO2 prices. But in the end, of course, uh, the ETS, there is no empiric evidence yet that the ETS really led to carbon leakage in Germany because there were instruments that pre uh, prevented this. So, and probably 
for a German and European transition, there will also be instruments like, for example, calm border adjustment, but also calm contracts for difference who could uh, prevent um, carbon leakage. And maybe an exporter of renewable, um, for example, hydrogen, Probably not, because at least the scenarios we see, um, Germany will probably need all its renewable hydrogen for its steel production or for its basic chemical industry and will probably be an, an hydrogen importer, either from other European countries or the major MENA region, but also probably from other countries. Because I think what's a big problem in Germany, and I don't know how this situation in Slovenia is, that of course the um, acceptance of, of large-scale uh, renewable energy sources is still a problem. So even if you have the potentials, the question is how much of these potentials can really be implemented due to cost and acceptance uh, issues. Uh, Professor Duic, maybe the question also addressed to you. How do you see this possibility for maybe some countries or some regions? We heard today that Denmark would like to be the leader uh, of a provider of some energy, low carbon energy sources. H how can you see this from the perspective of different energy sources in different regions? Uh, what is your position on that? Well, um, uh, we have seen during the last 20 years that uh, uh, each of the technologies relevant for energy transition is uh, first developed in one of the countries. Uh, so uh, Denmark, for example, uh, developed wind energy. Uh, Germany paid for solar energy. Uh, uh, Norway is paying for uh, experiment of fully electrification of transport. Uh, so we need also a volunteer country which will develop uh, synthetic fuels because we don't really know which way synthetic fuels will go. It's a very wide uh, set of options uh, and uh, by modeling them, we didn't really uh, come out with uh, meaningful results that we can say, yes, go that way. We know that there will be huge amount, amount of excess renewables. And uh, Denmark is the first one that will reach uh, that level. It's already 50% wind, and it plans to become more or less 100% uh, wind by uh, 2030. Uh, so uh, they will have huge amounts of excess hydrogen, and you have to do something with hydrogen. So uh, developing synthetic fuels in uh, Denmark uh, makes completely sense. But I see that more as a way of developing technology, which will an experience, which will then be copied by other countries, uh, than really becoming an export hub of uh, huge amounts of synthetic fuels. Uh, why is that so? Because synthetic fuels will use quite a lot of uh, renewable energy. Uh, and the uh, Danish will mostly have to use these synthetic fuels locally and they will not have huge access in uh, uh, synthetic fuels for exports. There might be some areas like uh, uh, deserts uh, uh, where you could possibly export synthetic fuels because you have a lot of local potential of renewables, but no market for these renewables and for synthetic fuels. But on the other hand, everything depends very much on the cost of electrolyzers and electrolyzers are expensive uh, equipment. Uh, and you want them to work 4,000 uh, hours per day, as Eva has explained. So you don't really want them to use only solar energy because that will not really uh, be competitive. You want them to have them where you have a good combination or many hours of renewable uh, uh, energy. So offshore wind, for example, is good or a mixture of wind and solar uh, is uh, uh, the best for synthetic fuels. Uh, can, we, can we maybe now have a discussion, a short discussion on uh, what new approaches in the modeling should be used? We have seen that uh, so far we've been modeling more or less these technological issues, but then uh, in, in the last years we have uh, come to the 
conclusion that we have to deal also with behavioral changes, with social impacts uh, of that, with uh, circular economy, which does not really affect the uh, the energy consumption but itself but rather on what products will we use whether these products will be low carbon intensive and uh, my question would be to to miss herbst about uh, this uh, inclusion of this society led uh, changes into into the modeling yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think in the recent past, uh, there is a beginning of more projects which go into this direction. For example, last year uh, started this new trends project we are working on for, for the European Commission uh, as part of the Horizon project. And there really, uh, we try to integrate these uh, circularity aspects. And this year, for example, started also a Horizon project, which is called Fulfill. And it, it's looking into sufficiency because this was a question earlier. So th this project really takes up the concept of sufficiency and wants to study the contribution of lifestyle changes and citizen engagement in decarbonis decarbonizing Europe. And I think what's a very big part of this project is its transdisciplinary research and approach. So very big part of this project is dialogue, dialogue with the citizens, dialogue between researchers, different uh, formats of dialogue to really get the, the public engaged and to really um, get more information on to quantify the impact of societal changes because we do not have this yet and this we can only get we need some kind of quantitative information we, which we can use for modeling and we will only get this information when we get in direct contact with the people who should then change their behavior and I think that's a really important part of this project and but of course in in the end we also need probably to use new data sources like now uh, these smart meter data for example is very important when we want to to look at how different agents will act in the future energy system like for example the prosumer which is now a trend which is strongly discussed discussed and on the circularity part we really need more knowledge on on how um different actions really impact the, the amount of material used in, in the system and how, how is the re, re, rebound or how is the rebound effect in the system, for example, then. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Guricar, uh, from the perspective of uh, electricity supplier or uh, grid uh, supplier, uh, what 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 are the societal changes there? I might remember, f I guess, one year ago or so, uh, when uh, in Slovenia nobody was expecting that there would be higher electricity demand due to some football match or something like that. It was, uh, I, I guess, there was some lack of electricity uh, because of some of an event which somebody might have predicted but was not predicted, and then it turned out like uh, to be sort of a problem. So how do you? Have these societal changes uh, taken into account when designing, or when uh, des designing the system, or when uh, discussing the uh, also the demand response activities and stuff like that? Because you were involved in the last years in also these new technologies which affect also the societal changes. Okay, so regarding the uh, regarding the the the, the designing uh, the future uh, the future expansion of the electricity system, uh, we are on the safe side for let's say rule of the thumb for ten years. So uh, our transmission system is over the uh, for let's say fifty percent. Okay, so on the TSO level, we do not expect uh, some huge um, difficulties. Uh, regarding this behavioral pattern of soci soci society level, uh, for example, like uh, events you mentioned or something uh, regarding uh, in these activities. Uh, but what are we particularly interested in is that we are expand expanding our 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 um, field of um, of uh, energy uh, um, planning. That is that we are we we are going beyond TSO level, so we are going 
on the DSO level. Our future strategy is uh, for Slovenia is that uh, also the planning of the distribution system operators will uh, will uh, will will come under the our roof. We see this as an es essential uh, part of, uh, of a, uh, and should be a part of a strategy of the government. So integrated uh, role uh, of one body, neutral body for future uh, electricity system planning. And uh, regarding the demand side management, we are, uh, of course, involved in a several European uh, research horizon projects uh, together with uh, other companies uh, in Slovenia and abroad, so on the EU level. And uh, we also, through those projects, studying also behavior uh, aspects of the society. I would like to say that one very important aspect we see also is our own uh, changing our own behavioral regarding the energy efficiency. So we see that on on that scale in the future we will also emphasize and we are emphasizing that. Uh, regarding the, the the energy efficiency starts with ours. So the, the, the greenest energy is the energy that is not used. And uh, we believe that on the aggregated level, it will also help also the this TSO level, which is f from now uh, quite on the safe side. But who knows what will come in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Duic, uh, maybe a, a connect to the uh, between the energy sector and the social uh, things, social innovations is uh, electric mobility. We expect that there will be a huge increase of electric mobility, but then on the other hand, uh, do we have these social studies who would confirm that this electro mobility will be as fast introduced as uh, possible? We, we had cases in Slovenia a couple of years ago when we have more of uh, electricity chargers than electric cars uh, on the street. So how, how can you predict this? You said that we are not predicting future, but somehow we have to model the future in the terms where we do some uh, estimations. Well, we uh, generally model that uh, as exogenous, uh, this social thing. But uh, you can see from... Uh, the experience of Norway that everything depends on taxation. Uh, if the government wants to have uh, electrification of transport, it's so easy. Just remove the taxes from electric cars and they become cheaper than uh, internal combustion engine cars and quickly people start buying them. Of course, in uh, Southeast Europe, uh, since we are buying a lot of uh, uh, second-hand cars, electric cars will come maybe five years later into that group of customers. We are not going to change that even with taxation. But even there, we could improve it. Uh, Croatia, for example, currently taxes less uh, very old cars than uh, new cars, uh, even if they're second-hand. So uh, it seems that uh, Croatian government is subsidizing the worst possible junk uh, imported from uh, uh, developed countries. So uh, uh, this is a political decision. Uh, you cannot model uh, political decisions. Uh, we don't know what is behind them. Uh, but uh, if you have right incentives, um, uh, people will obviously uh, make good decisions. I mean, um, of course, there are people who are uh, uh, geeks, they will buy electric cars, whatever, uh, just because they want them. And then you have a majority of people who are rational, economical deciders who will buy electric cars when they're cheaper for them. And they also cover the utility. And then you have uh, a small number of uh, resistors who will never buy electric cars as long as if they can uh, buy IC engine cars. So uh, 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 I think the crucial thing is the political decision here. When you're talking about political decisions, uh, what about this decision? If uh, the political decision will be that we will introduce, I don't know how many electric cars in five years' time, 
can we have the same decision that there will be enough electricity to charge those cars in every single hours of the day of the year? Well, this is an excellent question, but it, um, uh, you have uh, several sub-questions uh, here. Uh, so one question is how much additional electricity we will need. And this is between 5 and 20 percent. So it's not a huge amount of additional electricity, uh, uh, especially uh, having in mind that in Europe we have around 1,100 gigawatt of installed capacity and the peak is 520 gigawatt. Uh, of course, the question is, do we have fuels to fuel all this uh, capacity, which we see now that uh, this might be a problem, but the capacity is there. We can uh, very quickly electrify uh, cars. Uh, the other question that you ask is uh, about uh, uh, charging them in this, at the same time. Uh, in, the, in the situation in which everybody had a fast charger at home, let's say 70 kilowatt, uh, and everybody comes home at uh, five o'clock and has a completely empty battery and plugs in, uh, we would need 20 times more than installed capacity for a half an hour. Uh, of course, such an uh, extreme situation will never happen. Uh, but anyway, we cannot really allow people to have uh, uh, dumb uh, fast chargers at homes. Uh, uh, chargers will have to be smart. And most of chargers in cities should be slow chargers because cars are parked 96% of time, and they could actually help the system and not make it worse. And if we understand the importance of electric charging for the balancing of uh, power system in the future, uh, we can make important decisions now. Only uh, dumb chargers that make sense are those on highways, because there people want to charge fast uh, and they cannot wait for cheap electricity. But this electricity should be very expensive. It is already. Uh, the slow chargers, smart chargers on each parking lot at homes, at work, uh, they should be relatively cheap electricity because they will be balancing the power system. Uh, thank you for this uh, opinion. Uh, since we are slowly approaching uh, to, to the end of the round table, I would ask again uh, the participants uh, from the uh, Zoom, from the online, to if, if you have any questions, any comments, please raise your head, uh, hand and we'll give you the, the floor. Uh, in the meantime, I, I would like uh, maybe to, to conclude this uh, discussion which we had so far and uh, would... Uh, discuss in, in the last minutes about the modeling community. Uh, we know that there is a lot of models around. We know there are a lot of groups which work in uh, different countries on, on different scales and maybe what can we learn from all of these models? We've seen in, in the last year that there have been some open models available uh, on the market for maybe certain technologies uh, so, Ms. Herbst, uh, what is your uh, experience uh, in using the models? You mentioned before that you are it's in itself, just in, as your work, uh, you are using a lot of models. Maybe by knowledge uh, and knowing the other models, uh, can you maybe see the improvements or, and some models which can be adapted that would actually help also other so, uh, countries like Slovenia where we don't have enough capacity to develop new models but rather use models which could actually enhance our uh, strategies and so on. What, what is maybe your knowledge about that? Yeah, I think, I think there is already a very good trend, which is also pushed by the European Commission to make model improvements transparent and open source. And I'm really a fan of this, because only by sharing we can improve ourselves. I think what we also see is that we gain a lot of knowledge, not only via scenario comparison, but via model comparison. I think we did a very nice exercise now in a German project where we were also, I think, four or five different modeling groups and we were modeling 
integrated models and sectoral models. We were all modeling the same scenarios, but of course we got very different results. And this was by definition of the models the case. And, and what was very good is that we, we were seeing where are the big uncertainties, where do we have re robust results? And of course we learned from each other, the, sec the integrated models from the sectoral perspective, but also the sectoral perspective from the, from the overall limitations of the system, for example. So this was a very, very helpful exercise. In the end, I think open models and tra transparency is the best way forward and the best way to, to learn and also via, for example, open access publications. So this is really an approach we, we should uh, pursue. And maybe also there has been an initiative like the European modeling forum i think it's over now but i think we need more initiatives like this and of course there are open source models like for example leap and times which then of course can also be used by by for example smaller countries or or institutions with with less resources and then of course they will profit by open source databases for example from institutions like fraunhofer or others uh, Professor Duic, your uh, experience with the modeling community and different models? Well, um, uh, we have uh, started um, uh, regional uh, energy planning and uh, uh, modeling simulation uh, series of uh, conferences. Uh, Stana is uh, a member of, uh, of that uh, forum and we are organizing it uh, once a year, uh, and uh, there is exchange of different approach uh, to modeling, exchange of uh, knowledge, um, and uh, we have learned uh, a lot through that. There is um, also uh, now quite a lot of open uh, source uh, softwares. Uh, we are also exchanging that, and I think open source is definitely a uh, future. Uh, we are trying to build communities around uh, various softwares. Uh, no, there is no perfect software for energy planning. There are, uh, it depends on the question you have, uh, this software can be better or that software can be better. So uh, once you tell me a question, I can probably tell you which is the best software for you. We are currently doing uh, five, six different softwares uh, because that's necessary. And for each of those softwares, there is another community of people with which we exchange. Uh, the important thing is exchange. Uh, uh, there is uh, a very useful GitHub uh, site where we can exchange uh, runs, data, and open source software. Uh, and there are also informal exchanges. Uh, Mr. Merche, uh, maybe your experience is uh, you've been uh, in this uh, strategy negotiation uh, between Slovenia and, and, uh, and uh, European Commission with respect to national uh, energy and climate uh, plans. Uh, what, is, what is your uh, opinion on these discussions and negotiations? On one hand, uh, there is someone who is expecting uh, results from some policy development, and on the other hand, uh, there is uh, a certain level of uh, uh, of decisions which are made by the con by the member states uh, in itself and how how this goes together no definitely i think it is crucial that in such negotiation and discussion you have good own domestic model which uh, well describes your situation and based on that you can also argue your position points toward commission and you can also discuss with them more adequately so definitely this is i think key that we have our own national models either they are uh, open source or definitely but definitely they should be adjusted to the local circumstances especially for small countries which are really specific so this is something uh, really unique so uh, and by building this uh, modeling community with, uh, within the member states and of course I see here a lot of potential for exchange of data because most often we are looking for good projections of some international 
uh, data sets which are not influenced by our policies technology development energy prices such things or even some expectations of the development so these are data are crucial for good modeling but at the end yeah definitely i think it's crucial that you have your own models uh, at home and by that yeah it is much much uh, you are much more uh, relevant for good discussion either with national government or either with the commission and to you can better uh, structure the policy and also better structure the argumentation why certain specific situation is uh, relevant uh, for our country or for also for our goals which is quite often yeah quite uh, there are quite specific specific situation uh, so yeah good data uh, is uh, essential for such a discussion i guess no? good data and modeling yeah uh, thank you now uh, i would like to make the the uh, Final round of uh, of uh, your uh, comments. Uh, I would like uh, the members of the round table uh, to ask what is maybe your uh, final comment uh, on what will be the new challenges uh, in, in the short and long term future, maybe one or two things on the level of modeling uh, and on the level of strategic approaches to, to the future scenarios. Uh, Mr. Guricar, maybe start. Yes, thank you. Uh, I strongly agree with what Mr. Uh, Marchez said for Slovenia. It is essential that we uh, uh, design a robust and, and bottom-up approach uh, models uh, that will, of course, uh, have as much as possible uh, real data close to real-time resolutions. Uh, resolutions. And uh, regarding the system planning, uh, LS we 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 hope that ls will play the important role in the future regarding that we are the most experienced company in the energy field of slovenia for uh, energy system planning and of course we would like to share uh, and uh, our knowledge with with all uh, important parties in slovenia uh, to 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 optimal design because nevertheless this is the big optimization problem so to optimal design future energy systems for the optimal penetration of renewable energy sources on the other side in the middle uh, energy networks as a carriers and on the other side uh, users end users and of course energy efficiency it is the most important chain Ms. Herbst, what would be your uh, most important recommendations for improvements of the modeling? I cannot condense it to one most important, but a very important uh, thing is really, I think, the whole system perspective. So we see that, uh, especially we are sector modelers, and we see we cannot look at our sectors uh, independently anymore. It's really not possible. So the system perspective and the uh, the whole system impacts from all, uh, also from energy perspective, but also from economic and behavioral perspective cannot be neglected anymore. So we, ha we have to work very intensively on this combination of models on system perspective, but also on the, on the interdisciplinary approach, really also getting other disciplines into our research and not to make only modeling projects anymore, but projects which consist of modeling, but also societal, for example, research. That's one very important part. And on the other hand, I think what we see from an industry perspective also is that we have a very integrated planning problem there. So demand and infrastructure should more or less be developed at the very same time. There are very high uncertainties. So here, I think from a content related side, the regional aspects and the uncertainties in, the, in industrial demand and, and the respective supply modeling is also a very, very big challenge at the moment. Yeah. Mr. Merche, maybe your concluding remarks, remarks on this. Yeah, I agree what was already said. This is really crucial. So somehow I think we should focus on some specific questions which were already raised today to deep them and to be more in detail to provide proper expert background for our decision this is more and 
more more than ever essential that we are flexible and we, that we quickly give certain responses or certain illustration of potential uh, future solutions. This is, I think, very important and our models should give these results. But on the other hand, I think we should also be careful not to be too deep in our numbers and also, as it was also said, that uh, we, could, we should step uh, a step uh, back and look from a little bit from the distance to see the whole picture not to 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 get lost in some particularities but somehow to see the whole picture and try to give some uh, really general responses to the our society but uh, as it was said yeah definitely it is more and more interdisciplinary and of course one of the key challenges also to bring our results and uh, the consequences to the um, not just the expert society, but also to the uh, broader society to understand to which challenges we are trying to respond and what are the key issues in which we are all involved in the future. Uh, Professor Duvic, you are the first one today to, to start with the conference and I would like to give you the last word uh, of, of the roundtable. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, I fully agree with uh, uh, previous speakers that uh, uh, local uh, modeling capacity is critical for the energy transition and development of energy systems. Uh, it, now things are becoming much more complicated than they used to be, uh, and we need uh, strong local capacities. But regarding the choice of uh, planning software, uh, this depends very much on the question you put. Uh, there are softwares which are better for this and softwares which are better for that. Uh, one has to understand quite well what different softwares can uh, calculate. And uh, for each question, uh, different software may be uh, necessary to uh, apply. Uh, I don't really believe that we can build a software that can answer all the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, I would like to conclude uh, the roundtable on challenges uh, of the new modeling approaches. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all four participants of the roundtable, uh, Dr. Andrea Herbst, uh, Mr. Duic, Mr. Guricar and Mr. Mache. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, all of the participants uh, who are joining us today at the conference. Uh, I would like to invite you also to the uh, third day of the conference, which will start tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Uh, this will be dedicated to the forestry sector, and uh, the session will be called The Challenges of Modeling and Analysis in the LULUCF Sector. If, if uh, somebody from you who were not, uh, uh, not given the, the link to the tomorrow's uh, Zoom uh, meeting, I would like to uh, pay attention, maybe write an email to the uh, email address which has been now given to the, uh, to the chat section and we'll send you the link uh, with this. Uh, by this, I would like again to thank uh, all of the participants, all of the presenters uh, of the today's conference. It's been quite an interesting day and uh, a lot of information which I hope we will be able to use in our future projects together. Thank you very much again and uh, maybe see some of you tomorrow. <laughs>